we, we could start on time, but this is Capitol Hill. So we're just going to wait a couple more minutes. There's some people straggling in. Come on in and please sit uh, closer to the front so that anybody watching on the stream thinks the room is completely full. Okay, let's get started. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our symposium entitled Work, Employment, and the App Economy, Jobs for All, or Worsening Inequality. My name is David Goodfriend, and I want to introduce Dr. Harry Holzer, who with me will be moderating today's panels. Uh, Dr. Holzer is the John Lafarge, Jr. SJ Professor of Public Policy at Georgetown University's McCourt School of Public Policy. And the McCourt School is one of today's event sponsors. Uh, he is a non-resident senior fellow at Brookings and an institute fellow at the American Institute for Research in Washington, DC. Dr. Holzer served as chief economist for the US Department of Labor and was a founding faculty director at the Georgetown Center on Poverty and Inequality and is an affiliate uh, of the Institute for Research on Poverty at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which is totally cool because I grew up in Madison, and I love Madison. So, Dr. Holzer, to you. Uh, thank you, David. Good morning and welcome uh, to our conference, our mini-conference uh, on, on employment in the app economy. Uh, thank you all. I don't know how many of you got drenched in the, in the downpour. <laughs> Some of us, some of the hardy, less hardy souls likely turned back, uh, but we appreciate all of you uh, uh, being here today. Um, uh, the sponsors of the conference uh, are uh, the McCourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown University, uh, the Good Friend Group, um, and we got a lot of assistance from the office of Senator Mark Warner. Uh, so thank you to all of them. Um, so we want to talk about employment uh, in the app or gig economy. There's a lot of talk uh, that we all hear about this, a lot of commentary, sometimes very positive, sometimes very negative. Um, on the positive side, you know, uh, a lot of businesses, small businesses, entrepreneurs really love this new technology uh, and, and think it not only lowers their costs, raises productivity, but gives them unique access uh, to their customer market. And lots of customers love it for the convenience that it creates. Uh, but even on the job side, uh, th there are those who, who claim with, with, with some evidence that we're creating a lot of jobs in this sector. Um, in fact, Deloitte, the consulting company, uh, published a report about a year ago claiming uh, 1.4 million new jobs in this sector and several more million new jobs supporting it. I want to be clear, we're not embracing those numbers necessarily. It's, it's one of the things out there. Um, and a lot of people uh, talk very positively about, about the flexibility of these jobs, and especially for people who don't want full-time work or who need part-time or intermittent work, uh, the flexibility that these jobs afford them, uh, abilities to supplement 
their incomes uh, if they already have other full-time or part-time jobs. So, so that's all very positive uh, in a lot of ways. But then there are a lot of people fearful uh, of these trends as well, especially on the employment side, because we know that often when one new category of jobs are created, others are destroyed. Uh, people worry that the, the jobs that are destroyed are regular, traditional, full-time jobs, uh, not only with wages and benefits, but with all the legal protections that, that employees in the U.S. labor market uh, have, um, and that they will be replaced. And especially people who need those kinds of jobs and lose them might have to enter a sector where you don't get full-time employment, you don't get benefits, you don't have legal protections, and, and especially perhaps for some groups more than others or some parts of the country, the parts of the country now not really thriving uh, in the new economy. So, so you get these very, very mixed views uh, uh, on the positive and negative side. Now, for academic researchers and for others, a lot of this commentary does not seem all that well informed. Uh, not well informed by the facts. We haven't had that many facts. This is a fairly new phenomenon. Um, not well informed by evidence or research. Uh, not well informed by the experiences of people who actually work in the sector either as business owners or, or as, as workers, um, and, and, and not well informed by people we might call the stakeholders, uh, the people who represent the interests of workers uh, or tech companies or other small businesses. Uh, so, so that's the motivation for our meeting today. Uh, uh, we're going to try to bring forth uh, those voices, you know, one voice, one panel of researchers, um, whom I'll introduce in a few minutes, another panel of whom we call the stakeholders, uh, the business groups involved, uh, the representatives of workers who, who might be well affected. So uh, for more on that, uh, let me turn it back to uh, David Goodfriend, and I'll introduce David, uh, since he kindly introduced me. Uh, David is an attorney. He's the president of the Goodfriend Group, uh, a government relations firm with does a lot of work in the, in the telecom area. Uh, during the Clinton administration, he was deputy staff secretary uh, he has served as a legal advisor to uh, Commissioner Susan Ness on the Federal Communications Commission. He has been a congressional staffer uh, in the office of Congressman Charlie Rangel and also uh, Senator Cole from Wisconsin. Uh, and frankly, he was the one who, who conceived of this conference and, and convinced me to join him uh, in this worthwhile effort. So, David, go ahead. Thank you, Professor. I'll be very brief and just make a pitch for you sticking around for the second panel. Because the second panel, as Professor Holzer mentioned, is where we take the theoretical predicate that the economists will now lay out for you and apply it to actual workers in the field and tech, uh, technology companies in the community and ask this question that we'll pose shortly. Is the app economy creating jobs or destroying them? And if so, if it's creating them, where? In what parts of the country, in what communities, are we seeing equitable distribution or inequitable distribution of the benefits? So with that, I'll throw it back to Professor Holzer. Thank you. OK, so we're, we're going we're gonna to dive right in. Um, um, before I introduce our panelists, uh, I'm going to put some of the questions on the table that we hope uh, our panelists in this panel address and, and maybe in the second panel as well. These are some of the key questions. Uh, if we want to understand more uh, uh, about this type of work. Oh, thank you. That'll help. Uh, so the first question is just making sure we're all talking about the same thing. You know, what characterizes a gig job, uh, an app job? How different is it really from the broader category of non-standard work arrangements that we've actually been talking about for years? Uh, independent contractors, uh, temps in some cases, is it really different because it tends to be more part-time and more flexible, or, or does it really fit broadly within that category of work? Uh, secondly, uh, what seems to be the quantity of these jobs? Is this really a big enough phenomenon that we should be worried about it right now? We're happy about it right now. Uh, and if not today, then when? Five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road. But then if we've addressed the quantity questions, we, we switch importantly to the quality questions. First of all, is there much potential for full-time employment or full-time equivalent uh, in this type of work? Um, and, and, and the crucial question of if these jobs are being created, but at the same time they are destroying other jobs, if every time another Uber driver or Lyft driver takes a job of that type, does it eliminate 
a taxi driver or, or even jobs in public transit. Um, what are the relative qualities and, and, are, and are the jobs being eliminated more likely to be full time and to have benefits and legal status than, than the new jobs we're creating? But then the question that David raised, so if we, if we define these characteristics, the quantities, the qualities of these jobs, what is the distribution? Uh, of, of their benefits and perhaps the losses associated with them. First of all, as David said, wh where are these new jobs? What kinds of sectors, what kinds of industries? Um, but on the worker side, what are the demographic characteristics of the workers uh, losing the other jobs as well as gaining these? Are some groups of people made significantly better off by these opportunities while, while other people are made worse off? And, and if they are made worse off, who are they? Um, and also geographically, uh, we know, and we've heard a lot in the last few years, that there are many parts of this country that are not sharing uh, in the prosperity and the high productivity uh, that, that others are, are experiencing in the economy. Uh, here, of course, we're talking about the smaller metro areas, the rural areas, places in what's often called the heartland rather than, rather than the coast. Will they disproportionately share uh, in, in the losses uh, as well as the benefits? What does that look like? Uh, then I want to, at some point, at least potentially talk about data, which researchers think a lot about. Uh, is this a new type of employment that is much harder to see uh, in the traditional data? What kinds of new data sources uh, will we need to be able to track uh, th these new developments? And, and, and does it make the traditional data sources less reliable if this sector really grows in importance over time? And then finally, a little bit on the policy side. Uh, and this is not a, a really a, a policy conference, but, but I, think, I think researchers often have important thoughts uh, about policy, all kinds of questions. How heavily should we regulate the jobs in these sectors? Uh, should we do what California has recently done and declare a lot more of these workers regular employees subject to the full set of, of, of labor regulations? Uh, in terms of anti-discrimination and, and workplace safety and other things. What does it do for fields like workforce development? How do you prepare people? How do you give people skills if, if a larger chunk of the labor force is in this non-standard area? Um, how do you even help match workers to these kinds of jobs if they're having difficulty finding them on their own? So that's a long list of questions. And by the way, I don't, I don't know how many of these questions we're going to have definitive answers for, given that we don't have enormous data at our fingertips, and, and given that it's a relatively new field. But that would be one more thing that I hope the panelists help us flesh out. What do we know right now? Uh, what do we not know? But this is starting to sound too much like, uh, like Rumsfeld a few years ago, no knowns and no unknowns. Let me <laughs> use slightly different language, but, but questions like that. Uh, do, is there, if we don't know right now, is there a potential to understand these phenomena uh, much much more uh, in the next five, 10 years, where might be the new data sources, et cetera. So uh, with all that, let me now introduce the panelists. And I, I think it's a great panel. I'm really happy to have uh, all of these speakers here. Um, and I'm going to start on the opposite end for me uh, and move in. Uh, our first speaker uh, on the far end is going to be Catherine Abraham. Uh, Catherine is a professor of economics and survey methodology at the University of Maryland. She got her PhD in economics uh, at Harvard where well, we were not quite classmates, but <laughs> overlapped a little. Um, Catherine uh, is a former commissioner of the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, in fact, I think, I think you held that job for virtually the entire eight years of the Clinton administration. Uh, and then in the Obama administration, she was a member of the Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, as, as soon as David convinced me to put this panel together, I knew I wanted Catherine. Catherine knows more about labor market data than any other person in the country. I'm, I'm quite sure that's accurate. And she has thought about these issues for years and years and, and has worked on these issues of non-standard employment, independent contractors, temps, that whole area. So we're, we're thrilled to have Catherine with, with us today to share her insights. Uh, the second speaker is going to be Dimitri Kustas. Uh, Dimitri is an assistant professor at the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. He got his PhD in economics uh, at UCAL Berkeley, uh, much more recently than, than Catherine and I. He got his in uh, 2018. Um, Dimitri is one of the few people who's actually done real research uh, on this topic uh, and, and has identified uh, and, and, and started to analyze very new sources of data that we think have a lot of promise uh, in terms of helping us to answer the, the set of questions I, I've listed at the front. So welcome, Dimitri. 
And then our, our next speaker, last but certainly not least, is, is Chandra Childers. Uh, Chandra is a study director at the Institute for Women's Policy Research here in Washington, D.C. She received her PhD in sociology from the University of Washington. So part of your job is to keep the economists honest <laughs> and keep them in place. Um, Chandra spent a lot of time in her career thinking about inequality in the labor market, uh, especially along race and gender lines. And she has approached that set of issues from a number of different angles. She has written about, uh, for instance, access to good jobs. How, how do we define good jobs and, and who has access to them? Uh, in recent years, she's written a fair amount about automation uh, and, and the disruption that automation will, will create in these, in these markets. And again, from this, from this vantage point of who wins, who loses. Uh, so again, Chandra is perfectly situated to talk about those distributional questions. Um, and, and we expect she will uh, enlighten us. So uh, uh, welcome to all. Um, I'm going to start just by asking uh, our, our three panelists to take up to five minutes if they want, just to talk about broad questions of how, what, frames, what frames your thinking on these topics. How do you think about this phenomenon? How new is it relative to other forms of non-standard employment? Uh, if you want to talk about your research in this area, uh, uh, we're, we're welcome to hear about that, um, uh, and, and, uh, and then we'll move on from there. But starting with Catherine. Great. Thank you very much, Harry. Um, I, as, as you mentioned, I've been thinking about issues related to the way that work is organized for a while now. I won't say exactly how long. Um, and I, I guess what frames my thinking about the growth of the app economy in part is looking back at what happened in the 1990s. And in many ways, I see you know, the attention that's been focused on the app economy and the alarm that people have expressed about it as being very similar to some of what we saw in the 90s when we were looking at the growth in, in temporary help employment and contingent work more generally. If you'll indulge me, I'd like to read you a short quotation from a, a report. Um, that was, was issued, that, that's very timely, I think. The growth of various forms of contingent work poses opportunities for good matches between workers with differing labor force attachments and employers needing flexibility in response to changing market conditions. At the same time, some contingent arrangements relegate workers to a second-class status of low wages, inadequate fringe benefits, lack of training, and most importantly, loss of protection of labor and employment laws and standards. This is a very complex set of developments for which adequate data are not yet available to do more than address the most obvious problems. That's a, that sounds like a very good description of what we're looking at today. The thing is, that's from a 1994 report talking about the labor market conditions that, that people were seeing at, at that time. I mean, I don't, I don't mean to suggest there's nothing new in the world. What we were looking at in the 90s was really the growth of temporary help firms. What we're looking at today are these, these platform companies, and they differ in some really important ways that I hope we'll get, we'll get into. Um, but what I, what I think is true that there may, is that there may be some lessons to be learned from what happened in the 90s. At, at, at that point, temporary help service firms were growing really rapidly, and there was a lot of concern that temporary help workers were going to replace permanent employees at, at companies. And it was true that the, the temporary help firms were growing very rapidly, but in the end they kind of topped out at a few percent of the workforce in, in those jobs. That sort of looks to me like what we're seeing with the, the app, the mobile apps and people working through mobile apps. That the, num the sh number of people who are doing that sort of work at least part-time has grown very rapidly, but it's still a pretty small percentage of, of the labor force. Um, why was it that temporary help firms didn't take over the workforce? Well, I, I think it's because in, in a lot of cases, although there are advantages to companies to having you know, a, a, a margin of where they can adjust or a way to get people in on short notice to perform tasks, there are also real advantages to companies to having people who are permanent employees and really know their business and are invested in the success of the company 
And my guess would be that that's going to be the same thing in terms of business use of these mobile platforms that we're, we're likely to see with, with the app workers. But uh, it, it seems to me to be consistent with what the data so far are showing, but I, I guess remains to be seen. I, I know Dimitri's looked a lot at the data on this. Um. Dimitri? Okay, great. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be part of this panel and to uh, swap the snow in Chicago for the rain here in D.C. <laughs> um, so the, I think the big picture question, the reason we're here, is there's concern that the nature of work might be fundamentally changing. And one way that might be happening is that jobs that used to be done by employees and firms um, might now be done by independent contractors or freelance workers um, at, at these firms instead. So um, the, the, the challenge um, is that we don't really see it showing up in our main reliable government surveys. At the same time, I mean, there's these rise of new platforms like Handy and Uber. They didn't really exist seven years ago, and it certainly raises this possibility that something is changing. Um, when I got to the airport yesterday, I took an Uber to my hotel. Um, I was planning to walk this morning, um, but then it was raining, and Uber had a seven-minute wait time, and there was a line of taxis, so I, I took a taxi here. But um, you couldn't do this seven years ago. Um, so let me tell you uh, something, a fact that you may or may not know. Um, maybe you have known it from empirical um, casual observation. Two and a half percentage, two and a half percent of the workforce here in the Washington, D.C. metro area uh, makes some income on one of these new online platforms. That's comparatively pretty high. The highest is 2.9 percent um, in San Francisco. So there's a lot of people that are working on one of these platforms. So now let me tell you how I know that number. Um, so it turns out if you're interested in measuring the U.S. gig economy, you're in luck. Um, I, I've, I've talked with uh, um, government surveyors um, in other countries, um, in Europe and recently in Japan, and they've actually been impressed by uh, the U.S. data. We actually have administrative records in the U.S. of uh, freelance and, and co independent contractor relationships. So maybe very recently you got a Form W-2 uh, in the mail or probably delivered via email these days. Um, and so that form tells you your wage and salary if you're an employee, and then you report that to tax authorities. So that, that W-2 is you get, you get it sent to you, and also the IRS gets a copy. Uh, it turns out that there's a similar reporting for independent contractor and freelance workers. So any, anybody who has one of these relationships with a firm and makes more than $600 with that firm is going to get a Form 1099 miscellaneous. That's, that's what it's been called. Um, and then in a box on that form, Box 7, um, that's where your non-employee compensation is going to be reported. Uh, from, from next year, actually, it's going to be reported on a new form, 1099-NEC. But before I get into the alphabet soup, um, um, there's some more things I have to say about 1099s uh, later on when we talk about policy. But, but for now, there is a tax form um, that reports freelancer and, and contract relationships. So I'm, I've been part of a team um, working with statistics on income at the IRS to use these data to measure freelance and contract work over time, and we have these data back to 2000. So let me briefly go over some of our findings and um, looking forward to digging into some more of the details over the course of the panel. Um, so kind of the first fact um, is about the level of this work, what share of people are doing freelance and contract work. Uh, we estimate that between 10 and 11 percent of the U.S. workforce is earning income um, as a freelance or contractor. But how is it changing over time? Is it growing over time? So that's, that's what a lot of the concern is about. Uh, it turns out we don't see a lot of evidence that it's growing, uh, at least over the last decade, with one notable exception. Um, since 2013, we see a rise of about one percentage point of the labor force who's engaged in this type of work. Um, so in 2016, approximately, um, that's approximately 2 million people. Um, to put that into context, Walmart has about 1.5 million domestic U.S. workers. Um, but all of this, all of this growth is coming from new online platforms, platforms that didn't exist really before 2013. Um, I can't tell you exactly what companies, um, but, but think of online platforms, and, and we've searched for them in the data, and, and we have about 50 companies in that, in that definition of online platforms. 
Um, so that I told you that there's two million people that do this, um, and you can compare that to one and a half million full-time, uh, not, not full-time, um, domestic Walmart workers, but that's not a very uh, useful comparison because the people who are doing this online platform work, when, when we dig in, they're not making a lot of money. So the, the median person is making $2,500, and that's before expenses. And, and so if you file your taxes, you can, you can expense things like your, like your gas um, and depreciation. Um, so what, another thing that we notice is that almost all of these people who are doing this have a, a traditional job um, as well. So in this sense, it doesn't look like this online platform work is replacing traditional employment, um, but it's something that people are doing that's supplemental to, um, to their, to their uh, main job. Um, another thing that I, that I want to mention now and come back to later is the composition of these online platforms. So we have about 50 companies in there, um, um, but when we look, almost 90% of people are earning at least some of that online platform income from a rideshare company. So to some extent, to a first order kind of approximation, um, this growth in freelance and contracting work is basically the explosion of ride sharing in the US. Um, so that being said, at the same time, I think this new growth in online platforms is drawing attention back to that 10 to 11% of the workforce who's doing traditional um, types of independent contracting, which hasn't changed very much over time, but maybe deserves some renewed scrutiny from policymakers. So I'll end my opening remarks there. I, I look forward to digging in more with the panel and giving you my two cents on some policy recommendations. Uh, thank you, Dimitri. Uh, Chandra? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> thank you. And as Dr. Holzer said, you know, one of the things that I'm really interested in is inequality, and particularly inequality in the labor market. And so I, one of the ways I generally start thinking about these things is from the perspective of occupational segregation, whether it's sex segregation, racial segregation. And that's the same approach I took when looking at the impact of automation, the changing nature of work, um, and the gig or platform economy. And many of the differences when we see who benefits from or who is harmed by changes in work in the gig economy itself, a lot of those differences, it's driven by race and sex, uh, race and sex occupational segregation. Men and women tend to work in different occupations, people from different racial and ethnic backgrounds. One of the things I had not paid a lot of attention to um, until recently was looking at geographical differences in where different jobs are growing and where they're not growing, where we see a decline. Um, we've been looking closely at people are moving less now, but we know that jobs, whether the gig economy and other good jobs and bad jobs, they tend to be more regionally concentrated now in places, and the returns to those jobs have changed over time. And so one of the questions we went in looking at was why aren't people moving more to where those good jobs are? But the other question is, how do we use technology to help people overcome those differences? And so in looking at the impact of the gig or the platform economy, and looking at the diversity within that economy, I think is also really important because different different types of platform different types of platforms offer different opportunities for different groups of workers. And I hope to go through and talk about those and really looking at what it means for different sets of workers um, in accessing the gig economy and being able to take advantage of the platforms, or you know what are the you know, what are the benefits that workers have in the platform economy? Here we can look at, you know, health insurance, which, you know, those are benefits that tend to be tied to traditional employment and less so to the gig economy. Looking at worker protections, what protections do different workers have and benefit from? So those are some of the differences that I hope to talk about today as we look a little bit closer and looking at who benefits and who gets harmed by these changes in the gig economy. Uh, thank you. Thank you to all of you, uh, and, and very much hoping we'll get to, to those questions fairly soon. Let me just throw out a few questions, again, to any of you or all of you who want to talk about it, just on the issue of quantity and quality and characteristics mm -hmm. of the jobs. Uh, so our best estimate seems to be 2 million right now, uh, which is a little over 1% of the US labor force. 
uh, labor force I think is about 160 million. Um, is there any reason to think that that will go up significantly over the next bunch of years? Uh, um, Catherine raised this prospect of, you know, 25 years ago, we all thought that we'd all become temps, and that didn't even remotely happen. That ended up being more of a bust than we anticipated. Do we think that might happen uh, with this as well? Do we think there's a lot of more growth potential uh, in the online platforms, uh, again, over the next five to 10 years, uh, if not yet? So why don't we start simply with those numbers right now, and, and then we'll get into characteristics and quality. But do any of you have thoughts on those? Oh, and by the way, let me throw one more thing into. If most of it is ride share so far, do we have any sense of job destruction to match? You know, we know, for instance, that fulfillment centers uh, have a pretty negative effect on, on the traditional brick and mortar retail sector. Mm -hmm. Here as well, do we start to see, whether it's taxi drivers or, or public transit or anything else, shrinkage, relative shrinkage, relative to what we would have seen because of these online platforms, and, and, and might there be more of that coming in the next five or 10? Catherine? Yeah, I'll take a stab at your last question, um, which is looking at ride sharing specifically, what effect that's had on more traditional taxi driver employment. That's a, a little bit of a hard question to answer because we don't have exactly the right data. But one thing that I've been doing with some co authors is um, looking at, again, tax, like Dimitri, tax data. Uh, people who are Taxi drivers are mostly independent contractors, so they should be filing Schedule C's, which is the tax return for self-employment, the form for self-employment income. And similarly, these people who are doing ride sharing should, in principle, be filing a Schedule C. So we've looked at what's happened to the number of people filing those forms and the amount of income that they're reporting and, and so on. And in terms of whether ride sharing is replacing taxi drivers or just more people are using the service, there's a lot more people who are independent contractors doing that kind of work, including both the taxi drivers and the rideshare drivers. And the amount of income that they're taking in has gone up a lot. So I don't know what the right benchmark is. Between 2011 and 2016, real GDP went up by about 11 percent. Um, income to these independent contractors, including the rideshare drivers and the taxi drivers, has gone up, went up by about 70 percent. So it really went up a lot relative to real GDP as a benchmark. And what that's saying to me is that to a substantial extent, this, these mobile apps have created new demand. I mean, I can see it with my children. You know, it m might have been in the past that if they were going out with friends to a bar, somebody would have driven. They never drive. They, they call an Uber or a Lyft. Um, I might, when I might have driven somewhere before and wandered around the block looking for parking, now I might take an Uber or a Lyft. So I, I think there, there is evidence that part of what's gone on with this is that it's, it's not just displacing taxi drivers, though I'd hate to be a New York City taxi driver right about now, but it's really increasing the demand for these services. Uh, Dimitri Chandra, anything on, on that issue? Um, you can go ahead if you'd like. Go ahead. Uh, just have a few comments to add on. I, I don't um, – I agree with all of that. Um, I think a couple of interesting things to note is that um, traditional taxi, as Catherine was just saying, these, were also, these are also self-employed people and independent contractors. So in no sense here are these new jobs replacing full-time employees. They're replacing other types of independent contractors. Um, to the extent that there are now a large number of people working a small number of hours, replacing a small number of people working a, a long number of hours, I think it, the interesting point there is that total kind of output in this sector has grown. Um, there's maybe opportunities, there, there may be some losers in this, and there may be opportunities to kind of compensate them. Or um, So there's been a discussion in New York City, for instance, particularly regarding taxi medallion bailouts. Um, I think to the extent that this is... I think it's hard to make predictions about the future, and I don't necessarily want to do that, but to the extent that this is ride-sharing and these markets are maturing and becoming saturated, um, growth is likely to slow for ride-sharing. Um, and then I, I think if there is growth, it's going to have to come from other aspects of, of this app economy. We just haven't seen um, 
it, it just hasn't kind of caught on fire to the same extent that ride sharing has for, for a variety of reasons that we can potentially get into later in the panel. In addition, um, a, a lot of kind of state and local municipalities are now raising kind of barriers to entry for ride sharing, and that's likely to uh, drag on on the growth of that sector moving forward too. Do we have any feel for besides ride share what other sectors, other parts of retail, other parts of the service sector uh, that have the greatest potential for that growth we haven't seen yet? Um, I don't know if any of the three of you have any sense of that. I, I, I guess as I've thought about this, it depends on what you're how you're defining what you're looking at. We've really been talking about these mobile apps, these the platform work. But if we're thinking more broadly about the effects of technology on work and the way that work is organized, I think there's other things that we should be looking at as, as well. So if, if you think about technology, if you have more standardized technologies that can be deployed both within the firm and outside the firm, um, if you, you have new ways to work remotely, that changes how firms may want to structure themselves. So part of what I think that's led to is it's not just these platform workers, it's firms outsourcing work that they previously would have kept in-house because the technology lets them do it. So if you have more standardized uh, design technologies. Instead of having designers on your staff, you might outsource that work. Um, David Weil, who was the, the former head of the, the Wage and Hour Administration at the Department of Labor, has talked about this a lot in terms of the, the fissuring of work is what he, he calls it. And I think a lot of that has is facilitated by technology. Um, and I think it has important implications. If you used to be working for a big firm where you could start in one job and work your way up a job ladder, that created opportunities for you that you may not have if instead of working for that big firm, you're working for a little firm that's doing some specialized thing that's been spun off to your company. So um, I, I think in terms of thinking about what the future is going to look like, the mobile apps, the platforms are one thing, but I think there's these other effects of, of technology and how it's affecting the structure of work that we also want to be thinking about. So, so, Catherine, it sounds to me like you're saying that the app and platform jobs specifically are complementary with some of these other, that the technology yeah. is, is feeding all of them, but, but the, the apps, in fact, may lead to other forms of non-standard work. And so it, it's still... It's important to think about the broader issues as well as the ones specific. Yeah, it's not just the, the apps that match workers to perform a specific task with a firm. It's, it's technology that makes it easier for people who may not be sitting at a desk next to you to be doing the work and feeding it into the production process. Okay. Um, so I'm going to have one more on the characteristics of these jobs, and, and I'm trying to inch toward an area where, Chandra, you can start talking about winners and losers potentially. and, and uh, but, but let's talk about what that loss might look like. Uh, Dimitri, your number of $2,500 can be a little discouraging. You know, uh, it, it's not a lot of money. It sounds like it's all very part-time. Of course, that might ref reflect the current choices of the people who are choosing to do the rideshare jobs, uh, and especially if they have other kinds of part-time work, other kinds of full-time work. Uh, but do, do, can we, do we have any sense of the potential for these kinds of jobs to generate as much work as people might choose, so that people who want to work full-time, I mean, right now an, an Uber driver, if he or she chooses, can work 40, 50, 60 hours a week, and maybe a very small fraction. But do we have any sense for it? Is there the potential for people to choose a lot more? Or, or in fact, will, will the nature of this work, the businesses, you know, want those expenses more limited? Uh, so, so how do we think about that? And, and then I think we'll get into other things plus the distributional issues. Um, so I think maybe, maybe now is a good time to address how are people using these types of uh, new online platform jobs? Or do they go in with an intent to have it as a full-time job? Are they potentially providing opportunity that, that necessarily didn't exist before? And how might it be different from other types of work that are available? Um, so 
one thing we've done to try to answer this question is we look at what's going on when people start one of these jobs. So what else is going on in their, in their lives, um, lives? And what we find is that a striking result is um, that people start this kind of new online platform work in the middle of an income crisis. Um, so I have other work using anonymized um, bank and credit card accounts linked to, um, linked to income data. And, and we see a pretty common storyline that when somebody is in the middle of an income crisis, they run down their savings, um, um, run up their credit cards, and then people who start one of these app jobs, um, th th things stabilize, and they're able to replace um, about 70% of their lost income, at least, at least temporarily. Uh, Paul Oyer, an economist at Stanford, has, has referred to th these findings as a new kind of economic safety net potentially complementary with the, the existing safety net that we already have. Um, so kind of for people who are dealing with uh, unreliable scheduling, there may be other factors in the workforce that are changing the insurance that you get from your traditional job. And um, when you're kind of faced with that type of volatility or income uncertainty at a main job, it looks like um, kind of doing one of these app jobs may be a way to a way to deal with that, given that the barriers of entry are very low. Um, so another thing we've done is compare these new app jobs to traditional freelance jobs, when you start a traditional freelance job. Um, and what we find actually, I found this kind of surprising, we actually see bigger income losses uh, around the time you start one of these older platform jobs. And what's more is those income losses have been occurring for a longer period of time. Um, and another thing, we, we can see unemployment, um, people, people claiming unemployment for years before they start one of these jobs. And so the fact that people are doing it for smaller losses in income and more transitory, more short-run losses in income, that's kind of the finding we see for this online platform work. It is suggestive that people are able to, to more easily enter this when they have even smaller, um, kind of smaller more, or more short-run fluctuations. Um, and because the barriers of entry are so low, relative to other types of work that had been out there. I could just uh, jump, jump in to agree with Dimitri on this point. He's, he's, his work on this is, is really fascinating, um, you know, finding the, the, the way that people are using this platform work to respond to fluctuations in income. I also have some results, again, from some work with co-authors. It's very consistent with what you've found. Um, we looked at Ta again, administrative data on uh, people's earnings as, as taxi and limousine drivers. And we, what we found was that if people are laid off from their jobs and they're in a market where Uber has already entered, they're much more likely to take up some of that kind of work in response to being laid off than you know, if you were talking about becoming a taxi driver. They don't, they don't do that, but they do, they do seem to, in markets where Uber has entered, uh, take up driving. And, and Catherine, I, I know of your, your, what you called informal work in another paper you recently wrote where we were on a panel together. Uh, is that where you're thinking about this? It sounds a lot like... Yeah, it, was, it, was a diff it, was, it was different work, but maybe I, I, it's sort of cons consistent with that um, uh, paper that I, I wrote with Susan Hausman, I think is the mm -hmm. paper you're, you're thinking about, um, is we were looking at who it is who does you know, informal work more broadly that would include the platform work, but it also some of this other more traditional freelance type work. And what we found was that, you know, as Dimitri has said, for a lot of people it doesn't generate a lot of income, but there's a set of people who are experiencing economic hardship by their own account who uh, are more likely to do this sort of work, and they say that for them it's really important It's stabilizing their, their household incomes. So, again, very consistent with what Dimitri was saying. What I find very interesting about this, and I'm going to let David wants to jump in, uh, a lot of us have been worried about the potential for gig employment to lead to destruction of more, more traditional jobs. So far, it sounds like, and this may not be the entire phenomenon, it sounds like actually almost the opposite, that it's a little bit a part of a new kind of safety net where people who have already experienced those job losses for other reason can fall back and, and do this kind of work without, without worrying about whether they have to qualify for unemployment insurance or, or, or all the other things and, this, and, and the, low, the low startup costs that Dimitri mentioned, that, that, that this positive aspect 
uh, is one that I think has not gotten a lot of attention in the conversation so far. Uh, Chandra, you want, yeah, any, anything that you want to? No, I just wanted to build on that this, it also increases the opportunity when we see, you know, people entering into these occupations during economic hardships, it increases opportunities for different groups of workers. Um, following up on the example when we were talking about, for example, taxis and limousine drivers. Well, we know that, you know, once we've got Uber in a market, we see that women's representation among Uber drivers is double what the access they had when it was taxi drivers. Mm -hmm. So you really begin to see greater opportunities. To build on one of the examples, you know, you were talking about warehouse um, fulfillment center workers and the interplay between that and retail store workers. Well, you face a very different set of barriers in entering a retail store where you're interacting with customers than you do in a warehouse space, which can open up a lot of opportunities and reduce barriers of discrimination for workers of color, for immigrant workers. So you can get a much more, you get greater opportunities for workers who may not have had those opportunities at an earlier point. So especially during an economic downturn or when things are difficult, and all the time for workers who are at the bottom economically who may not have access. So we can see that this type of work, it really does have the potential to begin to help um, close some gaps all else being equal. We know there are other forces that are working on maintaining those inequalities, but we do see in specific forms of platform economies that you do have some greater opportunities. And you know, we also can see those greater opportunities, although it's a much smaller share when we look at platforms that allow workers to sell goods over, that provides opportunities for workers, say, in rural areas who may not have access um, to, you know, who may not have access to the ride share or some of the other, op or some of the other platform opportunities that are available. So it really does provide an opportunity, and I will say, given, you know, policy regulation, taking into consideration worker power, but it does give an opportunity to begin to close some of those gaps and open up opportunities for workers that might not have had it otherwise. So again, a more positive spin on the distributional side that, than many people mm -hmm. would, would start with. And I, I definitely want to come back to that and, and yeah. press a lot more on the distribution question. David wanted to jump in. Uh, maybe this is the time. Thank you. Um, this is getting a little bit ahead of ourselves because our next panel includes a representative of the Teamsters Union and the labor movement in general has been very active on this issue of how do you classify a job as part-time or full-time. But because we're on Capitol Hill, even though there was something going on in the Senate this week, I forget what, <laughs> um, over on the House side, there actually was uh, a bill that passed the House directly related to worker classification as either part-time or full-time. I'm talking about the PRO Act that was sponsored by Congressman Scott. And of course, California, AB5, legislation there that explicitly spells out uh, the so-called ABC test, how do you categorize a worker as either an employee or a contractor. All of these things obviously are gonna have dramatic uh, economic ramifications one way or the other, but I'm interested in hearing you speak about full-time employment, number one. So we've talked about temporary work. Is there data about full-time employment impacts? And number two, do you see any of the legislative attempts to address what someone from the labor movement might call worker misclassification, what somebody else might just, might just call classification, uh, impacting any of the trends that you've spoken about? So those are a little bit hard questions to answer. We don't, you know, a lot of the growth that we've seen, as we've already talked about, has really been part-time. It's people supplementing, doing something else with uh, working through the, the platform or the mobile app. Um, I don't know that, I, I, you may have statistics, Dimitri, on the share of these people who are really working full-time. So we don't see hours in the data set that I'm using, but we have a, a kind of a concept of what would be a full-time uh, equivalent earnings at, at the minimum wage would be roughly $15,000. Um, and the, the share of people who are doing it is, is roughly 10, 
10 to 15 percent of the, the total numbers I gave you before, it, it's still it's something like 100,000, uh, 100, a couple hundred thousand people. Um, but but um, it, it's just not the main way people are using these online platforms. To come back specifically to, to David's questions, um, I think, again, this point that I made before, if, if this is really about ride sharing in the transportation sector, these, the taxi drivers that existed there before, they were not employees. Um, so so it's kind of interesting that um, this conversation is framed about, well, first of all, I mean, these ride share companies don't actually claim that they're, that they're transportation companies. They claim they're technology companies and, and online platforms. Um, and, and payment processors. <laughs> and actually, you as the passenger are hiring an independent contractor driver. This is kind of the legal argument that they make. Um, um, so, I, I mean, back to the, the California law, and I'm not familiar with the details of, of this new House bill. I have to have, to have a look at, at it more closely before I respond to it. Um, I think if you look, the AB5 discussion is interesting because it Something that you see in the data, I mean, 10 to 11 percent, that 10 to 11 percent of people who are doing independent contract work, it's a, it's a broad um, cross swath of industries. Um, many doctors are independent contractors and um, will we'll be getting these 1099 forms. So they had to write a lot of exclusions into the law. And in the end, I think they were actually targeting rideshare and they, <laughs> they, there was a lot of collateral damage that they had, that they had to kind of consider. And I just think that, that this is, there's a lot of interest here, a lot of industries, and a national bill is even trickier just because of the different industries across the country that will be affected. Actually, if you look at the rates of people who are doing independent contract work um, outside of the app economy, the highest rates are in the center of the country, in agricultural areas um, and oil and gas areas. Um, a lot of these people are independent contractors. So there's a map in my paper, and you see that the middle part of the country really lights up. Um, there, something like 15 to 25 percent of people in some um, in some counties are independent contractors in the in, in the center of the country. Um, so that if you have a, a general bill about independent contracting, it's going to affect a lot of people in in uh, ways that you might not intend. So the, the bill would have to be written in a very um, in, in a very thoughtful way, and I think that that could be potentially difficult to do. Uh, may I take up the, this this question? as well, the, the AB5 question and, and whether we should be viewing ride-sharing employees as, ride-sharing drivers as employees. I personally think that's really problematic. If you, if you think about what we know about how people are using ride-sharing, it's you know, predominantly people who are driving a little bit on the side to make some extra money you know, topping up income from a wage and salary job. So the thing that's a benefit for, or, or you know, filling in when they have fluctuations in income, the thing that's a benefit for them is that they can decide when they're going to work and how much they want to work. Whenever they want to go out and drive, they can go out and drive. If you start saying that these people are employees and they're subject to minimum wage regulations, and, and so on and so on. The companies that are running these platforms aren't going to be willing to let them drive whenever they want to. They're going to have to start limiting who can drive and you know, when they can drive and, and so on in order to ensure that they get the, the minimum income. And it, it seems to me that that's really destroying what I see as the benefit of these arrangements for, for workers. I mean, I mean, of course, you... you the stories you hear that cause concern are stories about people who are trying to make a living doing this full time. And you know, maybe, maybe there's some way to, to treat them differently, though I don't know quite how you'd structure that. But I think you're, you know, I, I don't know what the right metaphor is. You're know, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. That's not a very good metaphor for <laughs> this. But you know, you're, you're, you're destroying something good in, in your effort to protect a, a a set of people from potential abuses. So this is slightly earlier than I thought we'd get into the policy conversation, but we're here right now, so let, let's build that and maybe we'll go back to, we still haven't talked a lot about potential job loss of this replacing the more traditional kinds of work, but let's come back to that, because I, I I, now we're in a good place to, to talk about this issue. So, this issue. so um, some of you uh, are, are familiar with the paper that came out a couple of years ago uh, by Seth Harris and Alan Kruger, late Alan Kruger. Seth Harris uh, was Deputy Secretary of Labor uh, 
uh, in the Obama administration. Alan Kruger was head of the Council of Economic Advisors, well-known labor economist. And they, they tried to, to sort of steer to a middle path on this issue. And they said, given the, na the unique nature of these kinds of jobs, especially if there's an intermediary, like a platform, a company creating this kind of platform, in some, some kinds of, of, of uh, regulations would be completely inappropriate, like the ones Catherine mentioned. Minimum wages, you have, if you have complete control of your hours, uh, uh, you know, maybe minimum wage overtime rules uh, wouldn't make any sense, and unemployment insurance wouldn't make any sense if so many of the choices are, are chosen. At the same time, they talked about other extending workplace protections, anti-discrimination laws, occupational safety and health, to these kinds of work. They talked about the possibility of collective bargaining of, of these kinds of workers, which you know, I'm sure the Teamsters will have a lot to say about. Does that make sense? Does that distinction for, for any of you, does that seem like a sensible way to think about this? So it's, so it's not as either or uh, as, as maybe the California law makes it out to be. I'm glad you brought that up, because if you hadn't, I was, go I was going to, to bring it up. They, I, I think this idea of independent workers who are somewhere in between employees and self-employed makes a lot of sense. I, I, it, would be, it would be a lot of debate about you know, what protections these independent workers got. But I think you're exactly right. It doesn't make sense to have them subject to minimum wage laws because they control how much they work. It doesn't make sense for them to be covered under unemployment insurance. But for sure, you know, workers' compensation, if they're injured while they're driving, you, you could bring them in under, under workers' compensation. And, and right, now they're, right now they're not covered They're at all. not covered because they're not, they're not em, employed. Legally, they're considered Except, I guess, in California they probably are now. But, <laughs> well, although, well, there's a lot of pushback. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of pushback. Uh, but but that, that seems to me to be a path that makes a lot of sense to go down. Okay, well then I want to shift back then to this issue, the distributional question. Um, and, and maybe we're not talking about job loss because we simply haven't seen it yet. And, and, and maybe our imaginations are limited by, by what we do see so far, either in the data or in stories. But how much should we worry then about that potential downside if we don't see it right now? And Chandra, I'm going to ask you, because if, if that occurs, and if we start seeing more of that, let's say either in some parts of retail, some parts in the service sector, and again, you've, you've described the opportunities these mm -hmm. platform jobs create for the folks traditionally left out, people of color, uh, mm -hmm. low-income folks, uh, maybe the younger or older workers, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and geographically. I don't know Dimitri mentioned the parts of the country where you might not have expected a, a lot of these types. So, so there's the geographic dimension. But Chandra, how should we think about any potential downside to this and, and who might be affected by that? Thank you again. <laughs> You're welcome. There's both. You can turn this into a, a gig job of some kind. <laughs> I'm the gig guy. Work. I'll just turn it on the mic. But looking at those protect, um, one, different platforms differ in the amount of control that workers actually have over the work that they do. So, for example, here I think about um, work looking at male dominate, so the ride sharing, which is what most people are familiar with and what most people are talking about when they talk about the gig economy, and they talk about flexibility, and they talk about workers being able to make those choices. And then if you think about the other platforms, particularly platforms for care work and do, where domestic work, where workers find those types of employment, those are predominantly, you know, those are female-dominated platforms where workers are doing you know, personal care aids, home health aids, you know, other work that's being done in people's homes. There's, while it's argued that there's a great deal of flexibility, and there, there, I'm sure there is compared to maybe your standard job, but there's a lot less than for Uber, which may be the example. So, for example, if a, an appointment is set up and a worker has an, a family emergency, well, the amount of fees that that worker may have to pay, you know, there are repercussions to being able to cancel that. Um, now, whether or not it makes sense, you know, in that instance, I wouldn't say to call that an employee. 
but we definitely do need worker protections and I think that regulations so when we talk about and not just you know women especially when we talk about those care jobs that's it's women a lot of them are immigrant workers a lot of them are people of color that are in these jobs so those worker protections are definitely important um, but I think it's also important um, and since we've mentioned the policy word um, to really think about ways that I mean when we look at the jobs that are projected to grow those are exactly the jobs that we're expecting where we're expecting to see growth happen and 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 that is going to happen no matter what happens in the gig economy those jobs are going to grow and so it is important I think for us to think about ways to offer those workers protections but also to make sure you know we say the gig economy um, or, or I think you mentioned it, thinking of it as sort of a safety net but for those particular workers in that care economy they actually lack a safety net because they do lack a lot of those benefits and I think in some of those and again we're t there's a lot of different platform you know there's different platform jobs but if we're thinking of for example the care economy you know those are workers who many of them this while most platform workers might be doing it as a secondary job or to build on to their full-time job that might already offer them health insurance and pensions and so forth these workers might not they're I believe are less likely to have those protections so those workers I think do need a, a more of a safety net and so that you know that requires us to really think about how to address that issue you know other than necessarily you know calling them an employee but how do we you know and we've seen some work around in that area of trying to address some of that but but it sounds like so if, if, if you think of the care jobs specifically mm -hmm. and the demographic groups it sounds like EEO protection if you yes. would be high on the list for them and maybe also Catherine mentioned workers comp we know yes. workers can get injured schlepping heavy bodies that are somewhat inert, et cetera. So those would be high in your list. Definitely. Uh, and, you know, if we're talking about physical injuries, I mean, that also goes to our fulfillment center workers. We're seeing a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of, of different, you know, again, and, you know, I know that's not a platform, but it's driven by, it's, it's the, by it's those platforms yeah. and uh, by, yeah. so, uh, yeah. Uh, I think that's a really important point. If I can just sure. tease that out a little bit. Yes, there's employment or work, let's say, driven by the app economy in the form of a gig worker. But then there's employment at something mm -hmm. like a fulfillment center driven by volume generated by an app. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I've struggled with how to define the impacts of the app economy on employment for precisely this reason. And I'm not an economist. I can only imagine how hard it is to measure. But if you assume that an app available anywhere in the country allows somebody to order a good or a service, and that that then increases demand for, let's call it brick and mortar employment, like a fulfillment center, I, I believe those numbers should be included in any examination of the impact of the app economy on, on work generally. In other words, it's not simply the temporary work, but rather the full-time employment uh, generated uh, by demand on an app economy. And again, beyond me how you would ever go about starting to measure that but it would be great if we could if we could learn more about it mm -hmm. Catherine, did you want to jump in either re relative to this or something a few minutes ago uh, you seen oh i i was just uh, reacting to chandra's comment about people lacking health insurance and i was th this goes way beyond the topic for today's <laughs> discussion that's okay we're, but we're not gonna be but, bound by but this. i will say this is yet another reason why in my mind it would make sense to divorce health insurance coverage mm -hmm. from the job that you hold yeah. it, there's all kinds of reasons why that's problematic it, mm -hmm. it's problematic in this sort of case it's problematic when you're talking about low-wage workers for whom um, health insurance costs would be big relative to the rest of their conversation their compensation and might be a real deterrent to their getting hired and I you know, it, it, it obviously raises a lot of issues that go beyond responding to these changes in work arrangements but it's yet another reason why I think divorcing those health insurance and employment would be a good idea before we leave the issue of winners and losers and and uh, distributional effects um, 
So there have been a few positive comments about geography, the geographic concentration, that it's possible, you know, for, for those really depressed areas, the rural areas, the small metro regions that, that, that have clearly been left out of this boom, and a lot of workers, fewer workers are leaving those areas now than we might have thought a few decades ago. Uh, is this, is this, does this create the potential for more employment uh, in those areas? Uh, maybe one of the more positive uh, um, reasons to hope for, for new job development uh, in those areas. Does it have a uniquely positive possibility uh, for those? And uh, Chandra or anyone else that has thoughts on that? I think it can. I think it definitely can. But again, I think it depends. Uh, you know, I, I was, you know, I was looking last night to look at, you know, access rates for high speed internet, because for the platform economy, you actually need access to, you know, and there are large areas in this country where people don't have. I, if I'm remembering correctly, like a pew survey found that like one third of adults in rural areas lack access to high speed internet. So which, that would be a precondition that would be playing a more positive role. Oh, sorry. Yes. And so, you know, and I was reading about, you know, again, we we see people go into some of these areas with ideas for expanding employment or turning, you know, coal miners into coders or <laughs> You know, whatever those things are. But as you look at, you know, people trying to do some of these things and then they run into roadblocks like people don't have access to Internet. People don't have access to cell phones. And that's not just in rural areas. We also see this in some urban areas, especially if we're talking about low income. And for some people, that smartphone is their only access. But in rural areas, you've got more people that don't have access to either. And so that becomes a problem. So there's a lot of potential that's there, but it, you know, again, bringing in the infrastructure, making sure people have access, um, because again, without that access to high-speed internet, but once you have that in place and people know how to use the technology, that's, an, you know, I think something we take for granted, but once, you know, that's addressed, I think you do open up some potential there to be able to overcome some of that, including more remote work, which allows, you know, for greater flexibility. It allows people, you know, one of the reasons people are moving less is because they're, they're tied to where they are because that's where their support network is and that's where their child care support is and that's where, you know, all the things they need and picking up and leaving isn't feasible. But if you can open up some of these other opportunities, it allows them to meet all of those needs. And again, it would require a lot more, you know, a lot more than just saying it, but I think it's something to be. But, but what you're saying is that, that the public return to making a, a big investment in that infrastructure, the public return, social return could be much larger even than, than a lot of folks are be creating some urgency around that. Dimitri, do you want to jump in? And yeah, so me, yeah, I have a few comments on both um, yours and, and David's points. So first of all, I mean, ride sharing is largely an urban phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Um, this, this is something happening in cities. And uh, another thing we haven't really talked about uh, is the capital platforms. Um, so kind of the numbers that I've been giving you, those are all for labor platforms. Um, something like home sharing, mostly a capital platform, that's also probably going to be largely an urban phenomenon. Uh, at least that's where most of the revenue is going to come. Um, however, I've, I've been to a few kind of barn rural weddings recently. They seem to be, and I've stayed at Airbnbs. Um, but other platforms like Etsy, um, these are other capital, kind of, there, there's some labor involved too. A lot of times people are making crafts. We don't have actually good measures of the number of people working in these, uh, on these capital platforms. Um, so this is showing up in the tax data in a different way. And when we come back to the policy, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about something called the 1099K gap. And so a lot of these capital platforms are in that gap. Um, but we don't have a lot of numbers on the people who are doing things like Etsy. And this is something I think that has the potential of you can be doing it anywhere in the country, these types of arts and crafts and potentially making money. And, and this is a way that the app economy could be benefiting more, um, more rural areas. That's, I think that, that platform is a nice example. In terms of the points that you brought up, David, um, about this indirect job growth. So first of all, to the extent that, the, that there are these other jobs that are showing up as independent contract jobs, um, Amazon Flex, for instance, is, 
is an example of the delivery drivers for Amazon who are independent contractors. Um, those are, I can't tell you for sure, but those are likely in our uh, numbers for the 1099 economy. To the extent that these indirect jobs are W-2 employee jobs, well, this is a different animal altogether. So this, I, I think you're trying to say, um, the concern is that there's growth in kind of non, not good regular jobs, um, kind, of, kind of bad regular jobs. But, but they are employees. So, so, I mean, bills like AB5, they could be good jobs too, yeah. So it is harder to measure. Um, there are potentially ways to measure. I think this is a really interesting question for future research, um, whether they're good or bad jobs. Um, the concern would then be if, they're, if they are bad jobs. Um, um, but that's a different animal altogether, and something like AB5 or this new House bill isn't, isn't going to do anything about that. So um, I think David and I want to open it up very soon for, for audience questions. We're a little ahead of schedule. I want to give each speaker, each panelist, one more opportunity, anything that, has, that we haven't raised yet that you think is an important dimension of this, uh, whether it's data, Dimitri, as you just referred to, whether it's on the policy side, workforce development, job matching, anything like that, anything you want to put on the table. And, and then uh, after that, we will open it up to questions and comments from all of you. But Catherine, do you want to start? And we'll move this way. Sure. You mentioned data, so I did want to uh, say a little bit about that. Most of the time when people are trying to understand what's going on in the labor market, what they look to are data from household surveys, like the current population survey or the American Community Survey. That's mostly what we rely on for assessing labor market trends. And unfortunately, I think it has become very clear that those surveys are not doing a very good job of capturing this gig work, the, the app economy, independent contractor work more generally. Um, one thing that's clear is that the household surveys are missing quite a lot of self-employment. How do I know that? I know that because we have linked up data from the current population survey, which is the big monthly survey that the unemployment rate comes from. Every March, they ask a set of questions about your, all your income over the previous year. And we've mapped, matched people who responded to that survey up at you know, behind the firewall at the Census Bureau to data on their, ta their earnings as reported to tax authorities. And what you can see is that there's a lot of people who say, you know, don't report any self-employment income, and then you look at their tax returns, and they have, they have self-employment income. And that gap has been growing over time. So I'm worried that our household surveys are missing some significant amount of self-employment and that that's gotten worse over time. The other thing I'm worried about is that there's a set of people who in the household surveys are being coded as employees who really are independent contractors, or at least they're being treated that way for legal purposes. Um, the evidence that I have on that is from a survey experiment that I and some co-authors did working with Gallup where we uh, they, the people got asked questions about whether they had done work for an employer. And then we added in some questions about, well, were you an employee or were you an independent contractor? And what we found was that about 8% of the people who said they worked for an employer and got coded as employees, in fact, when you probed, were independent contractors. So I'm worried about missing self-employment work, and I'm worried about miscategorizing people in the data that policymakers are relying on. So um, if we're, we're thinking about policy, you know, there's data policy as well as labor market policy. And um, I, I think it would be very desirable to develop household surveys. You, didn't, you wouldn't have to do it every month where you probed a little more with people about whether there was work you were missing and, and whether you actually had them categorized correctly. And I think that could be really important for tracking trends over time as all of this evolves. That might be in addition to making some changes in the way we, we collect tax data, but I suspect Dimitri has some thoughts about that. Great, so I wanna um, add to that and I guess come back to what Chandra, you called the P word earlier, the policy. <laughs> um, so I wanna talk about two kind of related uh, and policy implications. So I think, you know, we discussed there, there's other platforms here too. Potentially that's where it's going to grow in the future. But um, to kind of the first order, this growth in the gig economy is about ride sharing. 
And then one implication of that is you could actually, uh, the policy, policy should actually address what the gig economy is about. Um, and the, the ride sharing might have its own uh, unique policy considerations and externalities. Um, and whether policy should be national or, or local, I think, is, is an open question that may um, depend on people's policy preferences. So I'm currently working on an analysis of some recent regulatory changes in New York City. Um, so basically, they've capped the number of rideshare vehicles there, and they've mandated kind of minimum fare structures similar to, to a taxi fare. And so what we're finding is um, some preliminary results that this increased earnings for incumbent drivers. Um, but certainly, on the other hand, it's also limited entry. Um, and at the same time, some of the key benefits of this work, that it was flexible and had low barriers to entry, that, that's, that's, that's kind of been lost, for the, particularly for potential new entrants. Um, at the same time, it's not obvious that more and more structure is, is better for taxi drivers. Um, we saw in New York City that traditional taxi um, taxis were potentially exploited by, by owners of medallions and, and predatory lenders. Um, so it's, again, it's not obvious that you know, more structures and something like the taxi medallions is, is necessarily better. So I think it's a tough needle to thread for policymakers. I need to balance benefits to consumers because I think they're large, uh, benefits to the labor market, and also some costs to workers. You need to ensure that the work is safe um, and it's not just um, exploding because it's getting around 75 years of labor regulation. And I, I don't think that it's exactly doing that. Um, and the next thing I want to talk about is a little wonkier. Um, but, but maybe this is a good audience for, for tax wonk stuff. It's called the 1099K gap. Um, so I, I mentioned that the U.S. is the only country that can directly measure, at least the only one I've come across, that can directly measure gig work in tax data. And this is because we have a tax form that tracks independent contractor relationships. Um, our ability to measure this going forward is uh, becoming threatened, um, partly because online platforms have recently changed the way they file taxes, many of, many of the online platforms. And so there's now a new form. I told you about Alphabet Soup before. Um, I was talking about 1099 MISC. Uh, it's going to become 1099 NEC. Well, there's another form called the 1099K. Um, and what this form is designed is for payment cards and third-party network transactions. Um, and so an argument that many of the gig economy companies are making is that they're actually not hiring any independent contractors. They're technology companies. Um, they're payment processors, actually, just like PayPal or Visa. And so they've switched to this new form. And why does that matter? Well, this new form has a different reporting threshold, whereas the 1099 MISC stuff that, that people have been using for decades had the reporting threshold of $600. This new form has a reporting threshold of $20,000 and 200 transactions. So any individual would have to get more than $20,000. There's not many people, like I said before, who are working full time and making that. So two states have, have since stepped in and passed their own laws, Massachusetts and Vermont, to lower that threshold for the 1099K back down to $600. Um, um, Congress could act to do something similar. Um, and I've talked to some of the people, um, um, actually, we were part of a panel um, at the National, Catherine and I were part of a panel at the National Academies of Sciences, and some people were originally behind the, um, the introduction of the 1099K um, back in 2011, had said that it was not designed actually originally to, the intent was not to cover services, um, just to cover goods. So another thing that could be done is update the law to, to exclude services. And uh, all of this would um, make sure that this income is being reported. Um, why might that matter? Well, one is for measuring this sector and in, in these administrative records. Uh, another thing is reporting matters for tax compliance. So the U.S. and Treasury, I have to, TIGTA, the U.S. Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration recently came out with a report, and they estimated that there may be something like half a billion dollars in this sector that um, is not being reported that, that, that um, as part of a tax gap. So I think just by improving reporting, um, you can help reduce that tax gap. And there's money here to be on the there's mo there's money on the table here. So those are my two kind of policy um, implications. But I think the 1099k gap is certainly very actionable and potentially has bipartisan interest. Anybody here from financial services, ways and means, Senate finance? That was that was aimed at you. <laughs> Take Chandra, and then we'll open up. And I just want to make a couple of comments about a 
highlighting a couple of other aspects of job quality and how that job quality differs across um, different platforms. So when we think about job quality, first of all, yes, data. We definitely need better data and um, to get a better picture of what we're looking at and what it is and where things need to, uh, where we need to focus our policymaking efforts. But when I think about also job, qu the quality of jobs that's created, the quality of jobs that, you know, whether they're going away or not, which jobs those are, um, one of the things I think about when I think about those warehouse workers, again, going back to those workers, one of the things we know is that those workers are also up under a lot more, you know, scrutiny. The surveillance levels are high. Every, you know, move, the amount of time they have to fulfill certain orders. So those are issues of job quality that we see there. Um, in looking at, for example, you know, the care.com jobs or the care sector jobs that I was talking about earlier. Those are issues, for example, that when we talk about rideshare jobs, the payment processors actually handle, you know, most from the hiring of the workers to matching them with the driver to getting the payment. And the rider doesn't know who the driver is until you've accepted that ride. So it offers a level of privacy, a level of protection that we don't see in some of the other platform jobs. So if you're seeking a care job, and this makes perfect sense. If I'm inviting you into my home, I want to know a little more about you um, than if I'm jumping in a car with you. So it makes perfect, or if I'm going to leave my loved one in your care, I definitely want to know a little bit more about you. But those are things that also do impact job quality. It's, it's important to kind of think about those and keep those in mind. And one last thing I will say is the very fact that so many people are working in platform jobs to supplement their income from a full-time job also points to, you know, if we're talking about concern about jobs, I think it's also important to be concerned about the quality of jobs that already exist, that people have full-time jobs and do still need to take on these jobs. And the jobs that do exist also, you know, there's surveillance, they're being controlled, they're scheduling. And so I think those are also important things to consider when thinking about that. Good. Thanks to all of you. Uh, let's bring everybody else in. I think we have two mics and is there anybody out? Are we just going to one mic? At least no, one, no, two. No. Uh, and we have folks to run them. So maybe, I guess, if you raise your hand and give folks time, uh, give Sue and Brian time to find you and hand you a mic. Hi, uh, Lucy Glazer. I work with a creative ad agency called Unconquered. Um, so we talked a lot about, you know, people supplementing their existing full-time jobs with these part-time jobs. Um, I have a, du a dual-fold question. Are you finding in your data that there's any trend towards the types of full-time jobs um, that are currently in place? Like, are you seeing that the people that are supplementing are within a particular industry um, or, type of in or type of employment? Um, and then the secondary piece to that is obviously we've seen in the news a lot that Uber is exploring automated driver, um, you know, technology. And there's that whole lens that's taking it, you know, even outside of the app world to um, technology that moves itself. And I'd love to hear um, how you think that might impact uh, these these folks. So in some sense, the, the new app jobs might be the ones being destroyed. Yes. Uh, <laughs> rather than mm -hmm. destroying others. Uh, anyone, Dimitri, do you want to take a first crack? And Sure, that's, that's a great question. Um, in terms of the types of people that are being drawn to do this app work, uh, it's actually, so it's surprising, it's a pretty broad swath of the population, many different industries, many different income levels. Um, so something that we look at is, um, that we've looked at is whether your um, kind of parental income rank, that something people use in the literature, determines the probability you're going to do app work. And it's pretty flat across the um, parental income distribution. Um, so people are doing it across uh, across the spectrum. Um, your own income matters a little bit, um, 
but but that flattens out when we look at parental income. And it just looks like a, a, a large group of people, and many people do it for, for very different reasons. Um, th there's another group of people that we really haven't talked about, people, um, um, so, so there, there's people with kind of volatile schedules, um, but there's also people that can increase their hours on their main job or, or maybe have to have their primary, um, primary loyalty to that main job. And so when they have um, some extra time, they, they can take on this extra job. So kind of a couple of examples are people who are on military leave. That's, that's a, a common example of people who are doing this work um, or that are overrepresented relative to the population. Um, because when they get leave, they have some extra time and they want to make extra money. Um, in terms of self-driving cars, I'm, I'm a little more pessimistic on how quickly it's going to happen. Um, I think that this is going to have broader implications for the entire economy. Um, trucking is another example. It's obviously going to impact. Um, it's just going to reorganize the economy in so many different ways that I think it's hard to make um, predictions of, of, of about that. But I think it's going to be um, kind of a good thing in the sense that it... Um, it's going to push out kind of production possibilities, but but I just think it's going to have such broad implications that it's hard for me to um, to think through. Okay, uh, next question. My name is uh, Andrew Wallander. I'm a labor reporter. Um, I'm curious if your view of these uh, app companies is beginning to change as the they now start to chase profitability. Uh, a lot of them had big initial investments, and they were able to provide drivers with substantial signing bonuses and, and decent wages uh, for the miles driven. But now, as they are under pressure to be profitable, you see a lot of those bonuses going away or being much lower, and the per mile rates and everything is, is dropping as well. So is your view on the quality of, of, of this kind of work changing actively as, uh, as this happens? One, I, a partial answer to your, your question is that there is both a demand and a supply side to this labor market. So if these companies start cutting back on the bonuses and the, the rates and, and so on, that's going to have an effect on the, the supply of drivers willing to, to do this type of work. And I, you know, in, a, in a labor market like today's labor market where unemployment's been under 4% for a long, long time. I, I would guess that they're going to have to arrive at an equilibrium where they're offering compensation that's attractive enough to look good to people. So I, I, it, it doesn't really fundamentally change my view of what's going on. Let me get even wonkier for just a second, and I apologize to not only the non-economists, but people who took economics and couldn't stand this stuff. But you know, um, the, the word monopsony is jumping to my mind yes. in this conversation. The fact that there are only two companies, mostly, doing the rideshare stuff. Now, again, it's spread across thousands of local labor markets. But And, and, and of course, those, those people can do other things. It's not like the limit, but, but is, that, is that one more argument for us to be a little more proactive on the regulation side? That it, it, is that a useful concept for thinking about, about this industry, rideshare specifically, and, and why maybe we should move to at least moderate regulation a little more quickly, or not? Is it not relevant? And Professor, by monopsony, you mean the labor purchasing power. That's right. The company, the, the company who companies if, if, that are yeah, if, if you view Uber as and Lyft as as employers at some level, uh, from a national perspective, uh, there there ain't a lot of them. So I don't know if I, I, you made you made the thing that you worry about is if you have an employer and let's use that term loosely for for now who is you know, the only employer or one of a couple of employers who hire people with a particular skill set in a local labor market that they that gives them control over setting the the wage. Um, I mean, you're and you're right that there there really only are two big rideshare companies. But as you said, it depends on what other options people have, and there is an awful lot of informal work that goes on in the labor market that's. I think playing the same kind of role, it's not quite so easy to get into. That was part of the import of Dimitri's work is that these platforms make it really easy for people to 
get into this kind of work. But there are a lot of other opportunities out there, and so I, I think, to me, that really limits the power that Uber and Lyft have to set compensation levels. Except, except if people pick up some experience doing this stuff that like doesn't require an enormous startup cost of experience, but it's possible. Or, or people just really love this kind of work and it suits their, now maybe that's just some for the market to be sorted out, but, but it, it, it does seem to me that two providers may, but we can leave it as an open question, I guess. Uh, other questions? So, uh, Tristan Blair from uh, Senator Durbin's office, an intern, so it's my first Se one. Sir, I'm sorry, Senator who's office? Durbin's office. So, um, I have we two We all questions. started as interns. It's yeah, okay. so, <laughs> <laughs> happy to be here. Um, I have two questions. Uh, you mentioned they're centered around rural areas in particular, um, and I think Chandra and Dimitri, you guys would probably answer these the best. Um, so, do you find that there are other jobs? You mentioned arts and crafts as a possible area that this market for rural area for, for rural markets could expand. Are there other markets uh, f that rural areas could um, grow in on this particular issue? And also, you mentioned that there are twenty. I said I think it was twenty percent of the rural area that um, actually has like a, there's a large population in this area. So. Do you have any information on like the data in the data on the demographics of these people? Are they, you know, what 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 can you tell me about exactly who they are and um, also what their possible additions to the to the to the market in the U.S. could be uh, as far as going forward outside of just crafts and arts and stuff? Yeah. Thank you. Need me to clarify. Yeah, I, I don't have, one of the things in the data that I've seen is that it's unfortunately, they don't cut it where you can, you know, you can see whether it's rural or not. They don't really let you get into a lot of detail. But we do know that there are some pretty diverse, compared to what we generally think of when we think of rural, actually rural populations can be pretty diverse. Um, and my guess is that a lot of the places, especially that are struggling with broadband coverage, um, are probably rural areas um, with high, um, high proportions of people of color in those communities. Um, in terms of thinking about other platforms, the only thing I can even begin to think of, which would actually be a service to rural areas rather than coming from them, is, you know, getting like telemedicine into some of these areas where you've got a real hard time getting health care and in some of them hospitals are shutting down. Um, but, you know, that might be a way to begin to work with people to train people for, you know, serving um, as you know, the population ages, people in those communities. But I, I don't know, maybe you have some better ideas there. So I think there's a distinction here to be made between that traditional type of independent contracting and these new online platforms. Um, for a variety of reasons, it seems to have been um, useful to structure agriculture and oil and gas. That's what I think is, is lighting up kind of the, the middle of the country with this more traditional independent contracting, um, to use that there. Um, so it's something, I, I, I'm not an expert in that area, um, but, but those are the types of industries that, that are using it. In terms of the app economy, I think theoretically, yes, but we just haven't, haven't really seen it yet, at least in the labor platforms we see in the data. Um, I mean, something that, that we're not picking up, right, I'm just looking at domestic, but we know that Amazon, Mechanical Turk, things like that um, are very popular internationally, and particularly in kind of developing countries. I think mo most of the people on that, doing the work on that platform are in India, um, where the way, I mean, what's being taken advantage of there is differences in relative wages. Um, but, but one could imagine, I mean, there's the potential here. Now you can program from anywhere and you can copy edit from anywhere and, and be part of one of these platforms. So I, I think, I mean, maybe now, you know, you, people are more likely to, you might see people more like, less likely to move away from rural areas, more likely to stay there. and and do these types of freelance work because the returns, you, you can get higher returns from these online platforms. But it's just not a big part of the data yet, but it's possible that that's uh, a place for growth in the future. Okay. Oh, 
Hi, Juliana Dawson from Representative Jayapal's office. Um, you've spoken a little bit about job qualifications and uh, different areas in which companies might be uh, you know, not disclosing as much, particularly for research, but also for the public in general. Do you see any areas that, um, that require more oversight, whether it be for privacy purposes, for research, or other elements in that aspect? Do you see anything um, in particular? I think the, the, the thing I've mainly thought about is the same thing that Dimitri talked about already, which is if, if you think about people doing wage and salary work, there's very complete reporting of their incomes to the tax authorities, and that gives a way to monitor what's going on. But if you think about people who are doing um, independent contractor type work, and that includes these app workers, the reporting is much less complete. So in terms of, of oversight and under, you know, understanding what's going on in the labor market and uh, also for tax compliance purposes, thinking about the way that information reporting for tax purposes is structured seems like a pretty high priority. Um, so if wishes were horses, um, a, a couple of, so I mean, fixing the 1099 K gap, but it's, uh, we can't really pick up this type of activity in other data sets. So I think it would be great if we could think about ways to include it in some of these other data sets that many labor economists and, and other economists and, and broader than just economists um, work with. Um, and then Catherine had talked earlier about outsourcing, and we have very little ways to capture that in the data, and it could potentially be an important, um, something we, we want to uh, look at more closely. So if there are ways to think about how to collect that type of data and add that to our existing data sets, maybe um, not tax data, but other data sets that we have to add these types of questions and ways to capture these types of independent contact relationships and, and outsourcing. I think that would be extremely useful for research in this area. Okay, I think, and, we, oh. I, think I see one more and then maybe no, we'll... Chandra. Oh, Chandra, I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. Yeah, and, and I agree with that. And I think in you know, when I was talking about privacy and surveillance, and I do make that distinction between the data that we gather for research, especially so that we can begin to, to think seriously about policy, and in employers having control and access to individuals' personal data, especially when they themselves may not even know what data is being collected on them or they don't have access to that data. So maybe one more question, and then we'll shift to panel two. Hi, um, I'm Clara, and I work in uh, financial services. And I was just wondering if you see any trends in other industries besides ride sharing and healthcare, where you could see them shift into more of a gig economy too. Just curious. Thank you. So I, I uh, that's a good question. I tried looking at this in some work with a set of co-authors using data on Schedule C's, which is if you're seeing more of this type of work, it should show up. And really what we found was that it was you know, ride sharing, <laughs> you know, taxi and limousine services that have, has just exploded. There's some other industries where you're seeing more people reporting work as independent contractors, but it's kind of a mixed bag and it was hard to make sense of and the growth was nowhere near as rapid. Educational services, there were, there were you know, pretty high growth in people working as ed independent mm -hmm. contractors in educational services, and maybe that's related to the gig economy. But it's not going to threaten us, our jobs. <laughs> but it's unlikely to threaten our jobs. <laughs> okay. Um, What's that saying in economics? It's a recession when your neighbor loses a job, and it's a depression when you lose a job. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, um, I think this has been a great panel and put a lot of new facts and new ways of thinking uh, on the table. So join me in, in thanking our Terrific panelists. It's been great. I think we're going to, we're ahead of schedule, but since, yes. since we want to move quickly, we're going to take like a f five minute maximum for, to switch panelists. Uh, and then we're going to, so, so don't leave. <laughs> so uh, we're going to move into. Uh, That's right. Economists will tell you there's no such thing as a free lunch, but you get a free lunch <laughs> if you stick around until noon. I'm going to ask Brian uh, to help me switch out the uh, name.
Um, also, uh, because optics matter, if you can sit in some of these front rows so that the people streaming think this room is completely packed, that would be really helpful. There are no empty seats. For those of you watching from home, no empty seats in here. Everybody's just packed in. There are people standing in back. I think we have everyone. Oh, maybe. Oh, that may be. Is that, uh, there he is. It's ours now. <laughs> Some very valuable notes in Dimitri's computer there. All right. Well, welcome back, everyone. Again, my name is David Goodfriend. I'm president of the Goodfriend Group and uh, an adjunct professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center. But this is an event sponsored by Georgetown School of Public Policy. And thank you again uh, to the McCourt School, to Professor Holzer, to everyone who's helped make this happen. Uh, you heard in the prior panel from a group of uh, researchers who study the aggregate data. And now we're going to turn to uh, what we lovingly call stakeholders, people who uh, actually experience on a day-to-day -day basis some of the trends that we've been discussing. And I'd like to take uh, some time now to introduce our next panel. Um, starting uh, at, at uh, the end closest to me, Tanya Goldman is Senior Policy Analyst and Attorney for Job Quality at the Center uh, for Law and Social Policy, CLASP focusing on policy solutions that improve job quality for workers, strengthen worker protections, and increase economic security for low-income working families. Tanya, thank you for joining us. Uh, sitting to Tanya's right is Sam Lesh, legislative representative at the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, who leads transportation public policy and government relations for the nation's largest transportation union, focusing on the union's core surface transportation portfolio. Thank you, Sam, for coming. Uh, sitting to Sam's right is Dion Gordon. Dion is president and CEO of Tech Birmingham, a nonprofit working to strengthen and promote the technology ecosystem by promoting tech companies in the Birmingham, Alabama region, helping to recruit and retain tech talent and entrepreneurs, and providing opportunities for technical training and education. Thanks for making the trip up from Birmingham. Hope the rain didn't dissuade you too much. <laughs> All right. And finally, uh, to Dion's right is Graham uh, Defoe, Senior Director of Public Policy at ACT, the App Association, which represents more than 5,000 app makers and connected device companies in the mobile economy. He's also former counsel to the Subcommittee on Consumer Protection and Commerce, uh, Consumer Protection and Commerce of the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Energy and Commerce. Thank you for coming. Welcome back to Capitol Hill, your old stomping grounds. So I want to start off by, in many ways, what Professor Holzer did, setting the table by asking a basic question. What is the difference between a gig and a job? And let me start with you, Sam, since you represent millions of workers around the country. Is a gig the same thing as a job? Uh, well, thanks for, putting this, oh, there you go. thanks for putting this on, first and foremost. And uh, yeah, I think it's an important discussion. To yeah, if the red light is on, we can hear you. Um, you know, I think the part that gets lost in this is, is what the uh, what the nature of a, a, a set of gig work is going to be, right? Uh, you know, it, a full-time gig job uh, is, in our mind, a, a job without all the protections that it really should have. Uh, a part-time gig uh, job, whether you're doing it just on the weekends, if, like the previous panel was saying, you're just supplementing a full-time job, you know, for, for extra income, uh, you're doing it as a hobby, uh, something like that, you know, we, we can completely acknowledge should be a, uh, a component of the economy. It has been a component of the economy before technology, right? You know, people have had side hobbies and uh, side hustles and side jobs for a long time. Uh, the problem is, is when a, a reduction in the existing social safety net is uh, uh, compounded based on uh, gig jobs becoming full-time jobs and eroding what people are going to rely on later on in life, whether it's uh, uh, workers' compensation, whether it's uh, you know, uh, unemployment insurance, whether it's other benefits that they may not think that they need, but they, they really will when the time comes. Uh, and, you know, to see those two worlds collide in a way uh, that, you know, uh, uh, workers lose power 
is kind of our worst fear. So, you know, to us, there needs to be, you know, a rebalancing of how uh, that equation is calculated. Uh, and we're really thinking hard about how to do that. Dion, how would you define a gig and a job? Are they the same? Are they different? Yeah, uh, obviously, uh, there's a significant uh, difference there. Uh, job, of course, is something uh, a bit more structured, have more direct uh, oversight. Um, a gig is intended to be temporary, um, a bit more flexibility, obviously. Uh, but I keep asking myself, are, are we really asking uh, the right questions? Uh, and I, I think about, so funny enough, uh, the benefit of the gig economy was uh, proven to me in dramatic fashion this week when my best friend from college wrecked my new car. Uh, <laughs> he lost against my garage. Uh, and so I find myself having to rely um, on TNC, the transportation uh, network companies, Uber, Lyft. Um, and incredibly grateful for it, obviously. I also think about a friend of mine who was welcoming his uh, first child and decided to just uh, drive on the, on the side for some supplemental income. And a couple of things. One, I like the fact that the barrier to entry is incredibly low. Uh, I think that the more uh, government t tries to regulate, and I don't offer that up as a negative, I just think we do not have enough data to make informed decisions right now. Uh, I also think that it is, uh, we'll just say, probably profoundly unfortunate that uh, benefits such as health care are tied to employment in this country. Uh, and uh, app, the app economy is in some ways tasked with solving for that. Um, so uh, all that said, I, I think that um, this is definitely the, the future. And I think we need to appreciate it. I think we need to incorporate it. I think not just in terms of being consumers of it, we also need to look at this from an empowerment standpoint of exposing individuals to the opportunities to be coders and developers themselves. Kind of that steers us in a different conversation, but I think it is uh, uh, germane to it. Um, so at the end of the day, um, we're seeing some uh, unintended consequences, I think, from uh, legislation attempted uh, attempt that is attempting to uh, solve for something, and we really haven't even completely grasped the entirety of the situation yet. Well, in the last panel, we called it the P word, policy, but since you bring it up, you might as well jump right in. Uh, there is, as I said on the prior panel, some news. Yesterday, the House of Representatives passed, uh, the House of Representatives passed the PRO Act. Sam, I imagine you were probably very active in that. Again, trying to address classification of workers as full-time uh, or part-time employees versus something else. Um, and in California, we talk about AB5, uh, which tries to spell out what are the characteristics of full-time employment so that someone may be classified as a full-time or part-time employee. Um, what do you think, Sam, about the classification of workers one way or the other? And then I'm going to ask the rest of our panel to chime in. Uh, so that at least, at least we can address the most pressing contemporary policy issue and move on to some more specifics. Well, just one thing to clarify, too, on the PRO Act. So, you know, the PRO Act is really a, a, a union bargaining uh, kind of focus bill. And it does have an ABC test requirement in there. So, you know, classifying or, or deciding how employees are going to be classified. Uh, but that's solely done under the prospects of the NLRA. So just solely when it comes to union organizing. That does not impact their status as employees or independent contractors when it comes to, you know, uh, uh, wage and hour law or anything else. So, you know, it does, uh, even the PRO Act, which has, you know, was an, an, is an incredible bill, just passed the House. We couldn't have been happier with it. It was a really strong kind of bipartisan effort, and I think it's going to do a lot for, for people in this country just in general, uh, you know, to help organize it and deal with a lot of these problems. Um, you know, but, but even the PRO Act, uh, only deals with one part of it. You know, there is the misclassification fight that the Teamsters have been engaged in for decades, uh, you know, across a number of industries, but, you know, predominantly trucking. Uh, that, that still remains unsolved. And that part needs to be solved. Uh, AB5 was a, an incredibly crucial tool in order to do that. And, and I think the part that gets lost in especially the AB5 discussion and, and other states that are trying to do the same thing, New Jersey's, you know, been considering a similar bill for a while, uh, you know, is that we're really only in this position uh, because you had companies in this country who have so ruthlessly abused 
the existing system when it comes to classification. Uh, you know, we, we're in this position because workers for, for decades, I mean, especially in the trucking transportation industry, since the deregulation of the trucking industry decades ago, you know, you've seen the evisceration of what had been a middle class job, would have been a ladder, you know, for people to go with a high school education, with no, no high school education, to get a job as a truck driver, make, you know, good wages sometimes north of $100,000 a year with a union, with health insurance, uh, with uh, a pension, um, and be able to have that be kind of a ladder to stability uh, with the kind of rampant intrusion of independent contractors doing the exact same work under the exact same conditions when their employer is dictating, you know, when they need to work, what they can do, what they can't do, when they're going to be hired, what uniform they're going to wear, every single condition of their employment. You know, to us, it's just a gimmick that employers have used in order to, to avoid paying their fair share of what uh, uh, the system has otherwise <laughs> dictated. So, you know, that part absolutely needs to be dealt with. Graham, I want to ask you to weigh in here as well, since you speak really on behalf of yeah. app developers around the country. Um, we've heard now one of the panelists talk about perceived abuses. Is there another way to look at this? No, I, th I think that's a, that's a good question. Um, and thanks for having me. Uh, as as uh, David mentioned, we represent about 5,000 uh, small companies, small to mid-sized companies across the world. Most of them are in the U.S. here. Um, it's... Uh, it's something, I'm not a labor law expert, but we have been uh, hearing from some of our member companies on AB5. Uh, we're, we're trying to monitor the PRO Act as well. Um, where it might impact us, the definition of what a worker is versus an independent contractor might kind of surprise you because uh, we don't represent in our membership uh, TNCs. Those are really big companies. Um, we don't represent the really, the, the large sort of gig facilitators necessarily. Uh, they are apps, so we we speak uh, for them sort of nominally. But I think um, where where it really will impact our member companies is because a lot of our members sort of bid for jobs. They 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 do white label software, right? And what is that? That's where you are doing software for hire on behalf of, of another company. A couple of our member companies uh, are in Birmingham. I think we sh we share member companies with with Dion. Uh, Motion Mobs and Sagayo Studios, those two companies are, are the emblematic of, of the business model for our members, where they will uh, bid against usually larger companies to uh, create a software product on, on behalf of another company. And so the software itself has somebody else's logo. Um, and oftentimes, it'll be a 12-month job or an or a 18-month job or something along those lines. Uh, and in order to, to outbid the uh, the other the bigger rival, they'll need to hire up for for a, uh, a temporary amount of time. So they'll need to contract for a 1099 developer, um, and uh, in order to get the job and do a good job. So building the product usually takes a few more developers than maybe maintaining the product going forward, and that's a really common thing. So. Um, I think where we'll probably start hearing about it is in the in the software developer space. So, um, and just just to be clear, there are about five hundred thousand open FTE jobs in software in computing right now. Full time jobs. Full time jobs, and that doesn't include sort of the the contract work that our member companies are looking for at, on top of that, right? And and we're producing about sixty thousand uh, computer science majors every year. Uh, we're doing our best to close the gap right now, um, but I, I think it's starting. It's actually widening, and it has been widening over the last few years. And so, um, it comes down to making sure that uh, kids at the K-12 level are getting uh, exposed to computer science. There's about 45 percent of uh, high schools that provide computer science classes. That's way too low, um, and uh, making sure that the training is there so that those jobs can be filled. Um, and so, you know, for developers, the, the problem is, is fairly unique, and uh, the, the market for developers really, uh, a developer has a lot of leverage right now. They command about, a, on average, about a $90,000 salary. Um, and so, you know, I, what I would caution is if you're going to legislate around, uh, you know, change the line between what, a, what an employee and an independent contractor is, you could be careful not to be too over-inclusive uh, so that those who are independent and want to remain independent aren't accidentally going to be classified as employees, and our member companies are faced with a decision of whether or not to, you know, go all in with all the benefits and everything when they're just looking at a 12-month project. Um, you know, you don't want to 
force them to say, mm, we're going to pass on this one. We're not going to try to outbid the bigger company. And we're not going to, um, you know, competition suffers, I think, as a result. And so that's where, that's where we're kind of coming from on this, I think. Thanks, Graham. Now, now Tanya, I want to get you into this conversation, I was gonna, yeah, go ahead. too. I mean, uh, you represent and speak for uh, workers, but often at the low income end of the income spectrum. We just heard a comment about high in-demand workers who are programmers, who are developers. Okay, but I'd like you, if you could, to speak to the impact of all of this on the lower end of the income spectrum and whether you think app employment is helpful or harmful to the folks that you represent. Yeah, thank you, um, and thanks for having me. I used to be, um, before I worked at CLASS, which is an anti-poverty nonprofit, I was at um, the Department of Labor under the Obama administration, so I feel like I've been having this conversation for about five years, but I'm not sick of it yet, and we haven't, we haven't gotten to the solution. So I just wanted to first say, like, I think this is a really important policy discussion, but we're not operating on a clean slate here. So I want to be clear that there are existing federal, state, um, legal tests that govern who are employees and independent contractors. So California has really brought this issue um, to the forefront with the Dynamex decision from the Supreme Court and the AB5 legislation. But before AB5 existed, um, there were legal tests, excuse me, <coughs> that were already in place to help us determine, you know, who is an employee and who's an independent contractor and what rights go with that, as Sam talked about, lots of critical anti-discrimination protections, access to benefits like workers' comp if you get hurt on the job or unemployment insurance if you lose your job. Um, so, you know, even looking aside from AB5, which will really strengthen worker protections for a lot of workers, there's very good arguments to be made, and they were being made in court, that people like Uber drivers and Lyft drivers were already employees under the pre-existing legal test. So I just want to sort of level set a little bit there. And then for um, low-wage workers in particular, I mean, one of the real concerns we had, and Sam brought this up too, is that there has been... Um, increasing amounts of misclassification of workers, um, well, companies increasingly misclassifying their employees as independent contractors, which forces them to lose out on all of these benefits and um, access to a right to a minimum wage and overtime, so critical to economic stability. But one of the ways that I think the app world has really changed this conversation and has made it um, has sort of added an interesting element to figuring out who is an employee and who is an independent contractor um, is the use of algorithms and sort of these how management decisions are governed by algorithms. And so what this allows you to do is, in, in essence, mask a lot of the control that is being um, exhibited over workers by companies because it's happening through algorithmic decisions that appear neutral but have a lot of, of say in everything from how what workers are screened, who's hired, how their performance is monitored, how customer ratings determine if they stay on a platform. And I just want to point out that these algorithms are existing not just in the sort of app-based economy like Uber and Lyft, but you're really starting to see them come into more traditional economies. So in fast food and retail, um, algorithms are used to do workforce management software, determine workers' schedules, um, which we can talk about later, but there was a lot of discussion of scheduling instability, instability and implications for economic volatility for workers. Um, and there's, so there's a whole host of ways. I, I just want to sort of Thanks. lay the field there like that. that that's very helpful. Yeah. Sam, did you want to add yeah, to that? If I can, too, you know, the, the, the idea that the algorithmic side, I think, is incredibly important because whether it's uh, an app-based job or whether it's just a new kind of, you know, you mentioned the Amazon kind of examples in the last panel, whether it's a uh, kind of... Uh, new company into the scene that's really being driven by this technology, you know, the algorithmic side can both, I think, open it up to Dion's point, you know, reduce barriers to entry. Anyone can kind of sign up and you can get routes and not have to, you know, uh, contract with a, a broker or shipper or someone else to, to dictate where you're going to go. You know, but it's also a direct hindrance towards towards equality, right? You know, if you can, if you're an Uber driver and you can be deactivated instantaneously, you know, without any kind of uh, uh, way to to uh, to fight back against that, you know, based on a poor review or something else, suddenly if a, if a gig job is your only source of income, uh, you know, suddenly that same algorithm that you're relying on to get the job is, is suddenly a, a detractor for you being able to to have kind of, you know some sort of stable employment. That if you were in a, a if you were in a union, if you were in a full time W two type employment situation, you may have other tools tools, uh, you know, to, to combat the nature of your employment in a way that, you know, this, this 
uh, very fluid nature of a gig job doesn't allow you. Dion, do you want to react to that? Yeah, so uh, a couple of things. I mean, I, I think he's right in, in the fact that we need to make sure that people who are participating in this new economy, that they have the protections necessary, that people aren't taking advantage of uh, misclassification. I'm also thinking about the fact that, uh, again, at the end of the day, I'm asking myself, are we asking the right questions and are we solving for the correct problems? I, I think, uh, as Graham pointed out earlier, the widening uh, in income inequality gap, the fact that we are not graduating enough computer science uh, individuals, uh, I, I think it is all interconnected. Uh, and for anybody who is taking notes that would be reporting back uh, on policy matters, I would love to see more funding for computer science in our classrooms. I would like to see more opportunities for uh, adult work who are looking to move into uh, the app economy by becoming programmers and coders and developers and UI UI experts um, because at the end of the day there's still an opportunity cost that is going to be involved in all of this um, we have a lot of free boot camps that are provided in Birmingham as I imagine they are across the globe but uh, they are free only to those who don't have to worry about their bills um, and so even if somebody in a dying industry recognized that the industry is dying or that their job will likely be eliminated thanks to automation and AI, it is still steady income for that time being, and they cannot give that up to take a free coding class in the hopes that they will uh, somehow find a pathway into uh, that, that, that economy, that new tech-driven uh, economy. So uh, a, a bit of a, a tangent and a, and a rant there, but uh, again, um, I think it's part of a larger conversation and one that we're just not really addressing. Well, I want to let you keep ranting. Uh, I want to ask you specifically about Birmingham, Alabama, because in the prior panel, we talked about distribution of benefits from the app economy, from tech, and the sort of stereotypical jingoistic view would be Tech is only helping out the economy in San Francisco and New York and Washington, D.C., big coastal cities. You are coming to Washington, D.C. from Birmingham, Alabama, as somebody who is explicitly trying to bring the benefits of the app economy to a region of the country that presumably has not benefited as much as some of those big cities I mentioned. Tell us about what's going on in Birmingham. Tell us about whether or not your program is succeeding in extending the benefits of the app economy to your region? Um, good question. Thank you for permission to rant. You will regret it. <laughs> um, so, so first, first point. Uh, yeah, in, in, from a macro perspective, um, most states, most regions are losing. If you look at the measure of venture capital, 90% of that goes to three states, California, Massachusetts, and uh, New York. All right. Uh, even emerging tech hubs such as uh, Atlanta, uh, Austin, you know, in the grand scale, uh, it's a rounding error when you uh, look at the, the three lead, leading states. Um, so that is an issue alone. It is a major issue when you just consider the fact that uh, marginalized communities, uh, people of color, women, get a fraction of venture capital to help start their ventures. Um, you start to uh, also see a concentration of venture capital, of wealth, of technology in a lot of these mar markets clear winners and losers are starting to emerge. And so getting to what we are doing in uh, Birmingham, um, quite honestly, I think we've made tremendous impact. But uh, what makes me even more excited is the fact that we're getting a lot of on the ground data and we're starting to realize through some of these learnings uh, what it's really going to take to not just move the needle, uh, but start to move some mountains, uh, as we like to say. How are you really going to make systemic impact? Uh, how are you going to illuminate pathways to let people know that whether you're going to be a programmer, whether you're going to be a UI, 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 uh, UX expert, whether you are going to uh, be a storyteller, content writer, there's a lot that just goes into what we consider an app product and a technology, uh, but we don't have the lanes necessary to facilitate that. Uh, but one of the key uh, uh, lessons that we took away from this uh, initiative, just uh, briefly uh, called the Education Farm, one of our uh, programs, is uh, to uh, make sure that kids in K-12 environments have access to computer science. Well, it's not just about giving them devices. Uh, it's also about e elevating those educators to make sure that they are comfortable, that they feel empowered and equipped to deliver the curriculum because it also has to align with state standards. A lot of times you go to schools and you'll see closets full of equipment that has not been used 
because nobody took into consideration the IT ramifications. Somebody has to do that. Somebody has to tie the student accounts to these new. There's just so much that goes into it, so much that requires funding, so much around the conversations that are not being had. So that's one of the key lessons that we've identified. And uh, I think we've come up with a, a, a wonderful approach to address that. Uh, and then also taking that to the K-12 to career pipeline, kind of talked about it earlier, uh, for adults who are already in the workforce but want to level up, so to speak. Uh, how are we going to facilitate that? There really isn't a lot of funding. Of course, we have WIOA do dollars. Um, uh, there are some sources, but the pot is really not big enough. Uh, and so um, I am encouraged by the, the partnership that we have in Birmingham City Schools, the city of Birmingham, and with industry partners. Uh, Sagayo Studios is actually a part of this effort. Motion Mobs, as Grant uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, but we, we, it's a drop in the bucket. Uh, and we really need to do a lot more. Hopefully one of the things that can emerge from this experiment in Birmingham is a model that can be scaled and replicated because we still have to consider rural areas where they might not even have a math teacher, let alone a computer science teacher. Um, so where does distance learning come into the uh, equation? Uh, how do we um, uh, facilitate educators to be able to deliver uh, these resources, these learnings, these tools uh, across uh, rural populations, across, uh, quite honestly, urban populations that might not have access to those resources as well. So uh, again, larger context, but we are, we are not doing enough as a nation um, to really appreciate the changes that are going to be coming with this fourth industrial revolution. Jobs are going to start evaporating. There was a report that came out that showed Birmingham uh, it has 50 percent, um, is exposed, 50 percent of those jobs currently will either go away or change so radically the employers who currently hold them won't be able to hold them soon. So it's a major, major existential crisis that we have to address. And presumably broadband connectivity in rural areas and, and urban areas is important as well. We heard it mentioned on the last panel. That's clearly a, a policy item that's uh, uh, been very much in the news. Graham, can you address this issue of geographic and demographic uh, equality or inequality in the, in the distribution of app jobs? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. The, um, the geographic distribution of our member companies is pretty wide. It's we're in pretty much every every congressional district, all the 435 districts uh, in the nation. Um, we just are uh, going to wrap up in a couple of weeks a tour of the nation that we've been doing. Uh, we're hitting 12 different cities. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were in New Orleans. Next week, I'll be in Houston moderating a panel of uh, member companies and potential member companies that um, are going to be talking about the resources that are available in the local cities, basically. And so usually we have somebody from uh, local government. Occasionally we'll have a member of Congress come in. Um, but what we're doing is we're kind of showing, showing folks that there are vibrant app economy um, uh, outposts in, in cities that people kind of don't expect, right? And part of that is because we call it the democratization of, of entrepreneurship. Uh, access to capital is always going to be difficult, but um, what, one of the things that the big software platforms have enabled, and by software platform I mean uh, Apple, you know, Apple App Store, uh, Google Play Store, right, um, plus the devices that, and operating systems that come along with it, uh, one of the things they've, they've uh, produced is sort of an explosion of entrepreneurial activity because of the lower barriers to entry in terms of creating a software product that can suddenly, you know, very quickly have international distribution uh, in ways that software you didn't enjoy at all in the, in the 1990s, for example. We, we, the App Association started in, in the mid-1990s, and we, ha we have a, <laughs> several member companies that were kind of the original members, right? And they recall times of uh, having to, uh, you know, burn their software products onto CDs and put them into a box and sell, you know, contract with a distributor, try to get them into CompUSA um, or into Circuit City or into um, some of the ones that still exist, uh, that, you know, uh, it, it was a long, long process that was extremely expensive to the point where it cost about, on average, about $10 million to start up a, a software company back then. And now it's about $100,000, according to a couple of our venture capital company members. Um, but it's, uh, uh, all of that has created sort of a geographic distribution that's really good. Um, I think uh, uh, what, we, what we need to work on is the distribution uh, um, among uh, backgrounds 
And so there are still very uh, underserved uh, communities that are not well represented uh, in entrepreneurship and in uh, software development as a whole, right? Um, and so for that reason, I think I, I echo Dion in, in calling on Congress to provide more resources for education, for adult education, uh, for K-12 adult, uh, Perkins grants uh, being moved toward, toward coding, for example. Uh, but I also should share some of what our member companies are doing as well, because they are working really hard in this area. Um, we have, in, in New Orleans, we have Camelback Ventures, which is an accelerator. Does everybody know what an accelerator is? It's where no, it, tell us what an accelerator yeah. is. <laughs> it's, a, it's a group that sort of connects uh, potential entrepreneurs with uh, business know-how and potentially capital. Uh, and so it's, it's a way of meeting the right people who can help you uh, design a, a business plan that is viable and get access to capital to, to get started out. Um, their focus is on underserved communities, and so they, they work with uh, folks that are not the, the traditional uh, model when it comes to um, uh, racial background or socioeconomic status, right? Um, street entrepreneurs are here in D.C. is the same type of, uh, same type of organization. It's an accelerator that focuses on underrepresented communities, and so they're working hard on this. I, I think federal resources would be very helpful in this area as well when it comes to entrepreneurship. But um, those, I, I cite those examples to say where we are very aware that there is a problem when it comes to diversity in, in software development, in entrepreneurship, in, in tech-driven industries. Um, and um, we're working on it. And one, one side note as well, because I think uh, in the previous panel and in general when folks are talking about the app economy, um, because if you go to our website, actonline.org, and you see our app economy report, you might be confused because the, the way we define the app economy, it is software development and connected device companies um, uh, writ large. And so, um, and, and I know that folks are referring to app economy here as sort of coextensive with the gig economy so that it's folks that are looking for work using uh, a TNC or, a, or an app like that. Well, Graham, I'm glad you bring this up. Yeah. We struggled with this yeah. <laughs> in, in formulating today's panels right. because there's an awful lot of research about the gig economy and very little data and research about employment tied to the larger app economy, as you put it. So for all of you aspiring PhD candidates out there who need a research topic, we've got a couple uh, you could use. I, I do think, though, that, that your, your point, Graham, is well taken. I just Before I want to throw it at uh, Professor Holzer, who has some questions, Let's consider two things that each of you, Dion and Graham, just mentioned. Dion, you talked about the heavy concentration of venture capital in three states. But Graham, you talked about the rapidly dropping threshold of capital needed to do a software startup. Hopefully, therein lies a good news story that we could push some of that venture capital into other areas other than those three states because the threshold to get something off the ground has, has been dropped so dramatically. Professor Holzer. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, um, Dion, you made a comment that I found very interesting, uh, that you alluded to all of the potential job destruction that could be coming down the road. I assume you mean by, by automation, artificial intelligence, all that. And I think implicitly the notion that this might be part of the safety net against that kind of job destruction, people who lose those jobs and may not face it, you know, could do – some of this work part time, um, but on the other hand, people still worry about about the, the regulations, you know, the, the potential abuses, et cetera. So I'm going to ask each of you, uh, starting on this end with Tanya, to, to go and one on one. Just let's get more specific uh, on the issue of and and again, you know, what you heard in the last panel is we <laughs> economists tend to worry that regulation can be a job killer, uh, can raise the costs, and in which case it would be harming that safety net. Um, uh, but we also raised the possibility that there might be a, a third way, a middle way, that pr provides some of these protections, but not, not traditional wage and hour stuff. So I, I want to ask each of you, number one, where do you stand on something like AB5, uh, the California law that would, that would classify Uber and Lyft workers mostly as, as real employees of those companies uh, and, and make them subject to all of that uh, regulation. 
uh, and B, uh, how we're, we're in, in terms of that spectrum of how much or how little you would like these jobs to be regulated. You know, maybe you think AB five goes a little too far, but you're some like the other things. You know, I, I, before I mentioned the the paper by Seth Harris and Alan Kruger, where they said not not wage and hour law, not unemployment insurance, but maybe these workers can have the right to collectively bargain. And maybe there's other ways to make health insurance more directly applicable to them. So where do you come down more specifically on these issues? And maybe we can get you to tangle a little more with each other uh, if you have really different views on this. Uh, so let's start with Tanya. Sure, thank you. So um, I guess I'll come at it from thinking about two things, which is barriers to entry, which we've been talking about, and the quality of the jobs that you're going to have. So in terms of lowering these barriers to entry, my question is for who? So yeah, it's great to lower the barriers to entry, but there are certain aspects of these type of kind of app-based economies that are potentially not lowering barriers to entry and actually leading to, um, I don't know if it would be occupational segregation because I'm not running the numbers, but leading to discrimination or lack of access for older workers, workers with disabilities, or certain other types of workers. Um, so for example, a lot of the, um, like, Home care companies, Chandra started to talk about that this morning, that have started to use apps. They're almost functioning like home care staffing agencies moderated through an app or a website. But to do that, you have to go online. You have to be somewhat digital savvy. You have to have access to that. You have to put your own personal profile picture, which shows your race, ethnicity, et cetera, gender. Um, you also have to be timely in how quickly you respond to requests for employment. You have to be able to write a profile, potentially attach a video. So all of, I just give a very specific example to show that that is potentially going to lead to customer discrimination against some people and also screen out certain people who would be wonderful caregivers and care providers but don't have that kind of knowledge um, and ability to work on a platform in that way. So I, I totally agree with what others have said about lowering barriers to entry, but I just want us to know that that itself is a little nuanced. And then I am going to answer the question, I promise. <laughs> I'm not just <laughs> filibustering. Um, I am supportive of AB5 and legislation like this um, because I do think that workers' protections and rights have so eroded that we're in a really bad situation. I mean, I think we should be questioning why do so many full-time workers need to supplement their income with gig jobs and app jobs? Because they don't have jobs that are good enough now to support themselves and their families. They don't have jobs that provide the benefits they need to retire and have a successful retirement. They're losing their social safety net. And I think these types of jobs I, I was actually very heartened to hear that this is helping with economic security this morning, but it's certainly not the kind of job that's going to give you upward mobility, lead to full-time employment, help you save for retirement. So I think we really need to question um, what is the quality of some of these jobs in addition to just what is the access to the jobs. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, I think we also just have to be really careful about how are we potentially um, – exacerbating um, inequities by infusing discrimination into some of these platforms through hiring, through customer ratings, and through other elements that are really letting potential implicit biases affect how um, workers are going about and doing their jobs and the rights they have at work. Um, so I guess oh, the... Yeah, go ahead, good. I won't go into it now, but with all due respect to Seth Harris and Alan Kruger, I have a lot of thoughts on their independent worker um, some agreement, or some disagreement. So if we have time, I'll talk about that later. <laughs> I guess on the barrier to entry question, like I come at it from a little bit of a jaded perspective. I mean, we deal, you know, we're, we're a giant transportation union. We deal mainly with transportation. We have workers in every mode of transportation in general. And barriers to entry for anyone who's getting on a bus or is taking a train or is getting on an airplane is actually a good thing in some ways, right? You know, we have a mandated cap where which airline pilots need to retire because there's studies and data that show that, you know, there reaches a certain age where you're not able to perform the same job duties. Um, your truck driver gets drug tested before they are able to get out on the road. So that 18-wheeler that you're driving next to, there are, are there are sensible barriers to entry there to make sure that person is not, you know, under the influence of something. Uh, so the idea that all barriers to entry are bad, I think we would, we would disagree with. Uh, they need to be smart, they need to be nimble, and they need to open up opportunities. Um, uh, but, but there are inherent safety and other kind of considerations to take into play. Uh, on the AB5 stuff, I mean, I couldn't agree more with Tanya. Look, you know, Desperate times call for desperate measures. And, you know, uh, anyone who deals with people who 
engage in low-wage work constantly, uh, who are just struggling to make ends meet, understand how, how bad it is out there for a lot of people right now. And something needs to fundamentally shift. I think it's why you especially have a lot of lawmakers, you know, uh, you know, on both sides of the hill uh, who are talking about really dramatic, drastic policy changes because of how bad things are. There needs to be a seismic shift when it comes to a lot of policies that are out there in order to affect people's lives. Um, and a lot of that gets to what the job quality of existing jobs are, you know, not gig work, uh, you know, not part-time work, uh, but really just even full-time employment where, you know, union density is so low that, you know, that's, that job's not going to be able to, to put enough food on the table that you need to work two or three jobs just to make ends meet. That's a fundamentally broken system that needs to be addressed, and, and AB5 takes an important step towards doing that. Um, so, uh, yes, there is a, a good news story. Um, even when considering the fact that capital is, is being concentrated, that a lot of our uh, uh, mid-tier and, and uh, third-tier metros are, are being left behind. I, I think the people closest to the problems are also closest to the solution. Um, and I think that a lot of individuals, um, especially in the VC space, are starting to recognize that uh, they shouldn't enter these areas with a savior complex, right, but rather lean on the citizens of those regions to help inform what it is that those populations need. Um, in terms of success stories, I, I love uh, elevating just as a affirmation of what we're doing in Birmingham, the story of uh, Mick Strauss is uh, co-founded by uh, Ashley Ammons and Carrie Schrader, mother and daughter duo. Um, and they actually moved to Birmingham from Nashville to participate in an accelerator um, uh, at Innovation Depot, which is um, um, our incubator in the region, one of the incubators. And uh, they'll offer this up uh, when they were in Nashville. Their, um, their business was probably likely to, to fail uh, for lack of capital, lack of resources, city support. They came to Birmingham after hearing about the accelerator. Uh, and they raised a uh, million dollars, uh, 900,000 of which came from uh, the local Birmingham market. Uh, so I think, um, to me, that, that says a few things. One, there's just untapped capital in these regions that might not know how to deploy it. Um, there's a certain mindset in education that, that goes with investing in technology versus a restaurant or a traditional business. Uh, and I also, should also mention that uh, Ashley and, and, and Carrie, of course, are African-American women. Um, uh, the damning statistic, I guess it, you can celebrate it as well, though, is that it, they were the 37th and 38th African-American uh, uh, co-founders to raise a million dollars. That number should probably be a lot higher. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it's a, it's a good sign, I believe, that um, we can start shifting. We're seeing it in Birmingham, but I think it is indif indicative of what can happen throughout uh, the Metro should also recognize that uh, Steve Case, um, as you mentioned, the CDs that used to be shipped out, uh, AOL discs, the, uh, I guess it was like the first spam when you yeah. <laughs> really consider uh, Steve Case. <laughs> of course, uh, uh, DC-based uh, Revolution Fund, Rise of the Rest Tour, he chose Birmingham, I think, two cohorts ago, and Ashley and Kerry won that pitch competition, and he invested 100 k into um, their business as well. So great software. Definitely uh, just check it out, actually. But um, uh, so, so yeah, there, there are some points of light there. Um, and I think it is something that can be replicated easily in other cities. Um, to the point about AB5, I, I admit that it is well outside of my domain of expertise, uh, but I cannot get away from the fact that, to me, it seems um, uh, we don't have enough data to make informed decisions around what that looks like. Because um, two-thirds of those who participate in alternative um, work, if you will, are satisfied with the arrangement um, for the flexibility, for the, the lack of oversight. Um, they can kind of come and go as they please, do what they want. Um, it allows them, for instance, uh, under AB5, a freelancer might not be able to submit as many articles um, to whatever publication traditionally picked uh, him or her up. Um, maybe they don't want to do this full time. They just enjoy having that flexibility, that freedom to do this uh, as they decide. And so do they get, in essence, swept up and captured up 
into something that is overarching or overreaching that doesn't really uh, appreciate unique situations like that. Um, and that's not to suggest, of course, that we don't need oversight and regulations and that protections uh, should not be upheld. It's just how are we going, how are we going about that and, and what data are we basing those actions on? Well, Graham, with apologies to you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interject a, a question and then ask you to answer it because on both these panels we see attention. There is a genuine desire to do something good for the American worker. On the one hand, we hear what you just described, Dion, the benefit to the worker of flexibility and uh, inclusiveness that derives from gig work. On the other hand, Sam, we hear about employer abuses in misclassifying employees so that those employees don't get benefits of full-time employment. Is there a way to square the circle? In the prior panel, we heard somebody mention perhaps a third category of worker other than full-time or contractor that would be eligible for collective bargaining rights, for example, or representation as a whole. Um, is that the answer, or are we stuck in a kind of binary uh, world? I'll start with you, Graham, then I want uh, Sam to answer that. That's a tough one. Um, we don't, uh, the App Association doesn't have a, a position on, on AB5. Um, and uh, I'll get to your question about, you know, the, the third option. Um, but to, to address the AB5 question and the pro question, reclassifying what it means to be an employee, um, you know, I, I would be surprised if we, if we came out in support of uh, the AB5 type uh, reclassification or redesignation or, or redefinition of, of an employee uh, just because the, the the little that we've heard from from member companies is uh, more the concerns about whether or not they would um, lose their ability to get those uh, 1099 developers um, and so I, I think that's that's a little bit where we're coming from on uh, the AB5 question um, to you know addressing the issue of Folks stuck in low-wage jobs, right? Um, so no, you don't want public policy that uh, sticks people in low-wage jobs that they they can't move up and they can't move out, right? right. Um, and so one of the you know, one of the policy objectives then is mobility because we have uh, our member companies can't give uh, can't give away job. You know, they're trying to hire people at ninety thousand dollars a year. Uh, and they can't do it because people are in different jobs and they're, they have different types of training and they're, and they're not in, in software. We have uh, Denver is an example of a really, um, there are a lot of software jobs in Denver and uh, one of our member companies, you know, uh, you find that this is kind of a common thing for, for our member companies. They uh, created a, a, a boot camp called Secure Set that uh, it costs about $13,000 for uh, four or five months of coding and it's secure coding, it emphasis is on secure coding. Uh, we brought some congressional staff out there to, to meet with the folks that started up secure set. Um, one of the questions was, well, how, you know, how do people pay for this? Aren't there, it's $13,000, that's a lot of money. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the answer was, well, they, they borrow it and then they pay it off in the first year when they have their next job, uh, almost to a person. Uh, because they're making more than twice what they did previously. Hmm. Um, and so they just take the difference and, and they use some, some of the difference to pay off the student debt um, for, for taking that boot camp. And so it's an example of you know, one of the policy options to address the issue of um, uh, a lack of mobility, I think. Sam? Um, how do the Teamsters feel or, or is there a debate going on that, that you're part of as as a member of the labor movement? On the latter question, yeah, I, look, there's been a lot of discussions in, amongst unions, amongst other stakeholders and people in the space about the ideas of sectoral bargaining, right, of, uh, you know, expanding the population to, to, to really, you know, account for some of, you know, what you were saying before. Uh, you know, Professor, it's, uh, um, you know, it's, it's a hot button issue. Uh, but I think the other part that we're focusing on is not trying to, you know, uh, you know, uh, 
loses trees kind of in spite of the forest here, right? Uh, other people here would know this information a lot better than I do, but my understanding is that, you know, the economic data basically shows that, you know, the gig economy is still a, a small sector of the economy and is actually not growing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's staying fairly stable in terms of, you know, gross numbers of employment. Uh, that means that, you know, for all the focus on, on that being the hot button issue, you know, you're missing the boat when it comes to the other 80% of workers who are currently, uh, you know, in a very tough situation and are being misclassified. And, and we, wait, we think there's a way to, to do both. And it's, look, there's a deficit of trust here sometimes, too. Uh, you know, you have sometimes companies who come in who have uh, disruptive business models who also just very clearly don't care, it seems, from, from our standpoint, whenever we sit down, uh, you know, about uh, whether they are classifying someone as an independent contractor or a, or, or a W-2 employee. I mean, they're just solely going to do, and I, you know, in some ways we understand this nature of the world, do what's best for their, their bottom line in order to uh, to kind of move their business model forward. Um, but then you have other companies, right? Uh, you know, the Teamsters just organized in Northern California, the people who do maintenance work for uh, Spin, the scooter company. Uh, you know, those people pr previously had been independent contractors. In a lot of ways, there's no real reason why they should have been independent contractors. Uh, the company controls everything that they're doing. Uh, they go around, recharge the scooters, uh, can go and reposition them as need be. Uh, and the company, uh, uh, you know, in negotiations with us and with the city, uh, came to an understanding that these people would be reclassified. And now, uh, you know, they have a union contract. Their, their wages can go up. They can be part of the, the Teamsters of Western Conference uh, uh, plans, whether it's health and welfare or pension plans. Um, and that, to, to us, is as much of a, an important part of that discussion, right? You know, uh, there are a lot of people who are currently being abused, uh, who have no business as part of this discussion, you know, being classified as independent contractors. Uh, and we can't lose sight of those people. Tony, did you have anything you want to add? I just want to sort of challenge the notion that we can't have flexibility and employment or worker protections and benefits. I just think this is a real myth that is being perpetuated, and I think that's a great example um, that you just provided. I mean, we're talking about so much innovation in technology that we can use some of this innovation. I mean, we can harness this for good. Um, I can just give one like, really quick example. Um, there was, because I've been talking about scheduling instability, um, Susan Lambert and some other researchers did a study of the gap where they were trying to improve um, schedule stability for workers there because many workers don't receive their schedule more than one to two weeks in advance. So just to, you can imagine if you're trying to arrange child care, take classes, work another part-time job, that is just, it's impossible to live with that kind of instability. So they did this where they had a couple different interventions at a couple of gap stores and one of the interventions was very simply letting workers use an app to swap shifts with each other. Like, how simple is that? And what they found with that and the other interventions, that gap actually increased, let's see, median sales by 7% in those stores. Hmm. So here we have a very, we have a really nice example of you can enable flexibility for employees or workers using technology and help corporate do well, and I'm sure the customers did just fine also. Excellent. Um, I think I'd like to open up to questions from uh, the audience. If you have any, please raise your hand, and um, Brian or Sue will come around with the microphone to answer your question. Yes, I think, Sue, we have one closest to you. Can you raise your hand a little bit higher? There you go. Thank you. So my name is Andrew DeBraggio, and I'm with the Georgetown Center in Education and Workforce. I'm also a McCourt policy student, so hello, Professor Holzer. Um, I have a question kind of about the social capital implications of the gig economy or the app economy. I think it kind of breaks down into a few different spots. So if you're trying to access just financial capital, is it easier in a place like Birmingham than it is in a place like New York, D.C., San Francisco, just by the fact that you might be able to afford to live in Birmingham? Um, I also think as well with social capital, in terms of collective bargaining, if it might be a little bit more difficult if you're an Uber driver who never interfaces with another driver to, like, how would you be able to collectively bargain? And then last but not least, kind of implications for all of us who might use these apps. Uh, I mean, I like to think of going out with friends and we always Venmo the same $5 back and forth to each other um, rather than just like buy rounds or something like that. So <laughs> kind of what does it mean for kind of the commodification of social kind of activities and how can we kind of address that? Well, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, touch on your, your first question. Um, I, I think for a, a city like Birmingham, and I don't want to take it for granted that everybody's familiar, so uh, Metro about 1.2 million. Um, a lot of people here in Alabama and 
I guess are surprised that it's a, uh, a fairly large Metro top 50, but um, it, it has proven easier to, I think, um, get collective buy-in. Uh, and by that, I mean it is a city large enough where you can uh, make tremendous impact uh, through your ideas, uh, but you're also one or two individuals away from not just being able to call City Hall, but having the mayor to come down and advocate on your behalf um, uh, to lend his ear, his support, um, marshal the weight of uh, City Hall and the government. And so uh, I think that you will probably find that in a lot of other uh, metros as well. Um, to the question about quality of life um, and uh, the, the cost of living, Birmingham is significantly lower, and we actually tout that in some ways as a selling point. Um, and there's literally an order of magnitude difference in rent costs sometimes. Uh, we, we love uh, hosting companies from Silicon Valley when we bring them out to Birmingham. Uh, it, it, it sells itself. <laughs> uh, but then we also have cultural aspects, and that's something that uh, we – haven't really touched on. Uh, and, and by that, I mean, Birmingham has a rich legacy, of course, in the civil and human rights movement. Um, and I find it fitting that so much of the conversation in technology now is around uh, positive disruption and inclusion, which um, in many ways, that's what the uh, fight uh, in the 60s was about. Uh, and, and I see Birmingham's position as a leader then, and it can be a leader now. And I think that resonates, especially with millennials and Gen Z's. Uh, they want to roll up their sleeves and do things that increase equity, do things that elevate local populations to, um, uh, uh, to promote uh, development without triggering displacement. Right? Like these are all things that are aligned with the values of the current and upcoming uh, generation. And again, it's something that we tout, that we um, thoroughly embrace and, and sell as an asset. Um, and, and one of the things that, that I, uh, and I'll, I'll shut up, obviously, I, I love the work that I do. Um, and I was fortunate enough to play a role in economic development before uh, I, I took over this position, uh, but more so in uh, Main Street, as we call it, economic development. So restaurants, retailers, coffee shops, places that added vibrancy to an area. And our belief is that that is the best vehicle through which a city conveys its soul and its character, right? Those small businesses. You don't go to New Orleans for the Applebee's. All right? No, nothing against Applebee's, you know, but you want that authentic experience. And so uh, for, for cities and regions, small and large, that are asking themselves, what is our role? What do we look like? How do we play and participate in this emerging tech economy? I think that is a good question and a way to approach that answer. Where are the local assets, the local individuals that we can lift up and elevate? And so it's not necessarily just a tech-specific question around capital, but is capital also flowing to those entrepreneurs? It is probably about 800 to a million dollars, uh, 800,000 to a million if you want to open a restaurant. It's like significantly, the costs are outlandish. Um, and so coming up with ways to um, uh, lessen that jump, the distance between that jump of cooking in your house um, to uh, actually going into a sit-down full-service restaurant. So that might be a food truck, that might be uh, a restaurant accelerator, which is one of the projects that we actually uh, helped to develop in Birmingham. But again, all of that ties into the equation about quality of life. So if we are attracting, attracting talent and companies and trying to sell them on Birmingham, people want to know, well, what do I do after 5 p.m.? What is the bike uh, infrastructure? Where are the restaurants? Where do people gather? Right At the end of the day, uh, we will always want that just as a society, as a uh, species. Uh, and so I think um, it, it, for any uh, region asking themselves those questions, I, I encourage them to not think about that in terms of, uh, and not in isolation. It is not just a tech question. It is an entire ecosystem uh, question that we have to address. Deanna, I'm so glad you said that. And you also mentioned uh, Steve Jobs and Revolution and their effort to bring capital into new areas. I, I want to give a shout out to uh, Venture for America. Um, my son is a senior in college and just got a job offer to be a fellow at Venture for America, which is important for two reasons. My son got a job. <laughs> and uh, that is an organization that's explicitly trying to do exactly what you described, celebrating the excellence and character of regions that are not in that top three uh, category economically, but that have a lot to offer. And I think you're right that Gen X, Gen Z, Everybody seems to be focused on what's something I can do, roll up my sleeves, make a difference. I think you've just hit on something really important. And, any other questions? We have one back here. Go ahead. 
Uh, hi, my name is Matteo Lieb. I work at the uh, National Down Syndrome Society, and I'm also a, a current McCourt student, so it's great to be here. Um, Tanya, I guess this question's mostly for you. You talked about the fact that the, the gig economy or, and, and the app economy can sort of um, reduce barriers for some and, and then for others either increase them or, or not help at all. Um, you touched on folks with disabilities a little bit. You know, have you seen any research in, in what the more specifics are for you know, the disability community and, and even more specifically the, the intellectual and developmental disability community? Um, and, and if not, you know, what are your thoughts around um, the future of work for that particular community and, and will this be something that can help um, folks integrate better into competitive employment or um, keep them further out, which is sadly what we're seeing all too much in society right now. Yeah, thank you. That's a really great question. I don't think, I don't have a great answer about research and studies. I do think there is a growing awareness that we need to be very specifically focused on the disability community. Um, I think that technology probably has a lot of opportunity to help as you said, you know, enable um, folks with disabilities to participate in integrated competitive employment. Um, again, keep making sure that those jobs are good quality for them. I'm thinking of um, like call centers workers frequently now just work out of their own homes. Um, they don't have to go to a physical location to work. So um, that might be an opportunity, for example, if you are somebody with a physical disability with limited you know, mobility, that might be, provide an opportunity, but those jobs are currently misclassified and are not very good jobs. So um, I think also what we're seeing with, I mentioned briefly, like hiring screens. So there's actually a hearing yesterday uh, or two days ago at the House on um, sort of digital technology and um, civil rights and access to employment, and they're talking a lot about hiring screens and how this is seen as a way to um, increase access to employment for more people and diversify the workforce. But again, we're seeing that some of those screens and tests replicate discrimination and existing biases, which is going to have particularly impact some of the ways those screens are done, I think, for people with disabilities. Um, the last thing I'll note is um, we also see the use of, I've mentioned algorithms and monitoring is happening a lot for low wage workers in places like warehouses where they're wearing tracking devices and things like that. I think that has huge implications for people with disabilities that we need to be thinking about too. If your performance is being monitored um, and you are somebody who, because you're disabled or pregnant or whatever, needs to take breaks or go to use the restroom, um, you're going to have a lower uh, evaluation and performance metric and may lose your job because of that. So how do we I mentioned this earlier to Graham, how do we make sure that the people doing the technology and designing it are talking to the people who understand the worker protections and benefits and talking to the workers themselves um, to make sure that these uh, components are going into the creation of the technology? Um, Tanya, you fired some shots a little bit earlier at an economic paper that Harry Holzer here cited in the first panel. So. Uh, I want to make sure he has a chance to respond to that. Did, did you want to first articulate your criticism of the paper and then let Professor Holzer respond? No, no I actually don't want to respond. Oh, you don't want to respond. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I just wanted Tani to flesh out this sorry. criticism. And, and, and just, just to clarify uh, this proposal by Seth Harris and Alan Kruger said, we shouldn't think of these folks completely as independent cockers. We shouldn't. And I'm talking about the workers, the, the app workers, the gig workers, uh, not the software writers. They're not just like any independent contractors, but they're also not like regular employees. So we put them in a third category. They'd have the rights to collectively bargain. They'd have the right, you know, EEO protections and, and things like that. Maybe we'd work on giving them more uh, consistent access to health care benefits, but you wouldn't apply a minimum wage or wage and hour rules to them. You wouldn't give them unemployment insurance. So that, and that, that was this attempt to, some, to find something where you can regulate work quality in a way that makes sense, but not make it too costly or, or, or interfere with the job creation. So, and, so I really want to hear Tanya's criticism of that and then anyone else who wants to either jump in, like our, 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 would, would Tanya's, I'm still hoping to get a little, mix it up a little bit. Right? This is a Trump administration. People ought to be yelling at each other, you know. And so, you know you we'll throw a chair but, later. Go but, ahead. Yeah, but, but anyway, just you know, to see if others think that maybe Tanya's vision could be costly, could limit some of the dynamism uh, in this sector or not. I mean, very briefly, and I have huge respect for Seth and Alan. Um, I, I really feel like what parts of what they're suggesting, I actually agree with part of what they're suggesting, parts of what they're suggesting to me just codify eroded labor standards, right? So you're taking this uh, problematic nature of work for many low-wage workers, and you're saying these are the rights you're going to get. Um, 
and you're not going to get the rights, like minimum wage and overtime. Many workers are subject to wage theft. They're not getting their minimum wage and overtime, and they really need it. And to say, like, well, now you're just going to be classified as a group of workers who don't even have the right to that, to me, is very problematic. Um, it's particularly problematic in that um, the company, I feel like the companies with a lot of political capital and power are going to try to put a lot of people in that category of independent workers beyond just, um, just broadly, even beyond sort of the app-based economy. So you see um, Handy right now is a company that's trying to pass legislation all around the country um, basically saying if you use an app with your employment, your workers are independent contractors. Um, so, and this is not just an app-based world. And um, NELP, the National Employment Law Project, is really the expert on this, and you should go look to them for any resources on that issue. Um, so David Weil, who also got brought up in the first panel, is my former boss. At, he was the administrator of the Wage and Hour Division at DOL under Obama. He and I are actually working on a separate paper um, which has some of what Seth and Her um, Alan talked about, but is different in that we think there are certain rights all workers should have that shouldn't be tied to employment. Um, so things like anti-discrimination protections. Why should you be allowed to discriminate against an independent contractor who works for you um, because of their race, gender, sex, national origin, for example? But then we, the paper goes on to suggest strengthening protections for workers who should be classified as employment as employees and helping to clarify how to do that. I mean, I, I would just, I would just totally agree too on the on the wage and hour side, especially. You know, uh, look again to, to go back to transportation. You know, truck drivers right now, and not to harp on this, but this is you know the most common profession in people here from Hill offices in about 29 states in the country. Someone who drives for a living. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, just so just keep that in mind in terms of like a bare bones core uh, uh, kind of litmus test in terms of say, whether. Say that again, Sam. In 29 states, trucking or driving, driving yeah. is. The most common profession. The most common profession. Yeah. So right. BLS kind of combines a bunch of different categories together under this classification, but you know that includes truck drivers and includes uh, uh, taxi drivers, limousine drivers, uh, you know, shuttle operators, people take you to the airport or to your local parking lot, things like that. Someone who turns a key for a living. Turns a key. Okay. So what have you found? Um, so something to keep in mind is that truck drivers. You know, so if you have a, a commercial driver's license, so basically if you drive a big truck. Uh, you're exempted from uh, the FLSA uh, overtime uh, rules. So you're not eligible for overtime under you know, federal uh, law. Uh, in a union contracts, you get it. Uh, and we have really centered around the idea that you know, that should change, right? You know, that, that was a rule that was created uh, in 2020, almost uh, uh, you know, 80, 90 years ago. Um, you know, uh, to Tanya's point, nothing about the system or, or how you're deployed as a, as a, as a, a worker uh, should be should dictate whether or not you get a living wage at the end of the day. Uh, should should not dictate that you know if you work more than forty hours a week you shouldn't get some sort of top up in order to uh, uh, account for that extra time you're away from your family. None of that should should uh, incentivize the fact um, that you know companies are then going to push you harder and harder with no negative recourse. Right? You know they don't have to pay you anymore to make you work eighty hours a week. Now, does that truck driver like being able to drive Uber in the off hours? I really, is, trucking is a bizarre industry. <laughs> um, I don't mean to put you on the spot. No, no, no. You understand think, the question. I think a lot of those truckers would, uh, would rather keep trucking during that time, and there are very sensible rules about limiting how many hours a week they can work. Uh, you know, some uh, truck drivers in general right now can drive about 83 hours each week. I mean, 83 hours. I mean, anyone else who works a normal job, that's twice your normal work week uh, that they are allowed to legally drive. So that person next to you, uh, you know, in a truck, just realize what they're going through uh, in order to, to, to operate. And some of this, again, goes to this wage and hour stuff. A lot of drivers are not paid, uh, you know, by the hour. They're paid basically for only when the wheels are moving on that truck. So their incentive here economically is to drive as much as they can in order to earn more money. And some people hit their physical limit and don't want to do it anymore, but other people are saying, screw it, you know, I got bills to pay, I got mouths to feed, or I just want to earn more money and, you know, be able to take some time off. Uh, that's a perverse system that needs to be uh, recalculated. And, you know, I don't think an app-based worker should be excluded from that kind of recalculation. Other questions? Brian, there's one up here. Bill Palmer from Congressman Adderholt's office, an Alabama member. Uh, wanted to kind of get... First. Let me just get that out of the way. I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, wanted to go ahead and try and ask a question contrasting the kind of disparate view on uh, the ability of 
workers who are facing these kinds of employment conditions where they're in a type of what sounds like underemployment and the opportunities that were demonstrated with, I think you said 500,000 open software jobs with the opportunity to finance education necessary within the first year. Um, I know there were also some comments about the gig economy's stagnation and lack of future growth opportunity, it sounded like you were alluding to. So I was kind of trying to hope to, you know, reconcile those things in my mind. We definitely need more software developers. So, uh, you know, wherever they want to come from and wherever, what, wherever they want to, whatever job they want to leave, I think um, there's a lot of benefit to, to being a software uh, developer. Whether you're doing 1099 work or you're doing full-time employment or you're starting up your own company, which I think um, is, another, is another option. You know, that's, uh, I remember companies would, would love that. Um, so, uh, and I, I actually, uh, Tanya mentioned a proposal earlier, if I, it's okay to uh, mention that. I think you mentioned that there was somebody pushing a proposal where uh, the existence of an app means that you're not an em employee. Um, yeah, uh, again, we don't have uh, an official position on something like that, but that doesn't sound like a great idea. From our perspective, I think the, the existence of an app is just a means to an end. Uh, contract work has been around for uh, decades and centuries. And um, so I think thinking of it in, in those terms is probably the wrong road to go down, right? Uh, the existence of the app is not, uh, as, as a facilitator of gig work, is probably not um, what should drive the primary driver of policy, I think. Sorry, hopefully that answered a little bit of your question. I, I think what, what we really want to see is um, in, in all federal resources that could be put toward, um, you know, uh, retraining for work. So the De Department of Labor, Labor has um, sort of apprenticeship programs where you can be a registered apprentice. Um, we had some issues uh, a few years ago where um, apprenticeship programs are pretty pretty expensive to run because there's a lot of paperwork that has to be filed with the Department of Labor and uh, a lot of boxes that need to be checked. Um, small companies have more difficulty with that than large companies. Uh, so the Chance in Tech Act, which uh, passed last year, uh, was, was a big deal because that uh, created, it required the existence and, and funded the existence of third parties that can help with the uh, registration process for uh, apprenticeships. Um, that's been a big help. I think uh, apprenticeships are only one option, though, because apprenticeships, by, by their nature, you're not making very much money in the apprenticeship so that you can get the job later on, the, the, the well-paying job, the good-paying job later on. So that's just one, one aspect, and yeah, I'll mention that. And I just wanted to uh, add a, a, a quick... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, when considering things like apprenticeships, which uh, I think are, are good and they do provide a pathway, I think they can be strengthened. I think it's also uh, important for us, especially policymakers, to consider the uh, the entire person, right? Uh, how do we introduce wraparound support and wraparound services uh, for those individuals? We've experienced this in Birmingham a couple of times where um, a a uh, candidate simply could not pursue um, this apprenticeship because of lack of transportation or child care. Um, so uh, again, and, you know, listening to Tanya, I, I appreciate uh, her pushback. And um, my, my friends at Apple say yes and a lot. <laughs> and I have adopted that, I think, is a yes and approach that we can take to this. A lot of um, the answers don't have to be mutually exclusive. Uh, but it reminds me of uh, just designing for the margins, right? I think for a lot of folks are kind of familiar with the concept that uh, if you want to increase uh, or promote uh, wheelchair access uh, via a ramp, you also make it easier for uh, those with mobility issues or those, uh, uh, you know, maybe a, a pregnant mother who uh, doesn't want to have to, you know, go over the curb or something like that. But when you design for the margins, everybody benefits. And so um, I think that is as important as we uh, kind of wrestle with the, the policies uh, that we need and uh, what we already have that should be strengthened. So, Dion, one of my favorite stories about accommodations that had unintended benefits for lots of people was closed captioning, which was designed to include people who were hard of hearing, but everybody who's ever been to a sports bar 
loves closed captioning. Yeah. So I, I, uh, I second that. Any other uh, questions? No? Well, with that then, I think we should uh, thank our panel for participating today. Uh, Thank you to uh, Senator Mark Warner of Virginia for sponsoring our room today. Thank you to Professor Holzer and the Georgetown University McCourt School of Public Policy. Uh, my name is David Goodfriend. It's been a pleasure to have you today. Thank you all of you for attending. We are adjourned.